Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the City of Independence, welcome to the City Planning Commission meeting on this July 12, 2022. Let us rise for the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. For those of you who are not familiar with our meeting, it is the responsibility of this commission to hold public hearings and make recommendations to the Independent City Council on matters relating to zoning and land use within the city. We also consider and make decisions on plats, special use permits, and other issues as well as changes in codes and policies that relate to city planning. For, for those who wish to speak tonight or think they may speak. Mr. Chairman, if, if I could interrupt, please. Yes, sir. Uh, we did not take the roll this evening. We'll need to do we that before we proceed. All right, let us do Thank that. Thank you. Staff, call the roll. Commissioner Ferguson? Here. Commissioner... Um, Michelle? Here. Commissioner Nesbitt? Here. Commission, Commissioner Wiley? Here. And Vice Chairman Preston? Here. Staff, would you please state for the record who are absent? Um, let's see. Chairman McLean and uh, Commissioner Young. Thank you. We have a quorum, we'll, pr we'll proceed. Thank you, Councillor. For those who wish to speak tonight, please remember to address all comments and questions to the chair and keep your comments brief and on point. If you agree with the previous speaker, simply indicate your agreement and move on. Our procedure for each case is as follows. First, the applicant will be recognized to speak on behalf of their case, followed by anyone else in attendance that wish to speak in favor of the matter. Second, those who are in opposition or who have questions regarding the case will be recognized here. Then, if there is opposition or question from the public, the applicant will be allowed a rebuttal period to address those concerns or questions. Once the applicant is finished, the chair will declare the public hearing portion of the case closed. Further comment from the public will not be recognized. At this point, the commission will have the opportunity to discuss the merits of the case with one another. During this discussion, the commission reserves the right to ask questions of all parties concerned. Finally, the commission will render a decision in the case. For those who may testify or think they may testify, please stand for swearing. Do you solemnly swear to tell the whole truth before this commission? If so, say I do. I do. Thank you. Please be seated. Our first item of consent agenda, the Planning Commission meeting for June 28, 2022. Are there any questions or exceptions? Then we adopt those minutes as presented. Mr. Vice Chair. I move that we uh, approve the consent agenda. Thank you. Second. We have a second. Second. 
roll call staff. Commissioner Ferguson? Yes. Commissioner Michelle? Yes. Commissioner Nesbitt? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Wiley? Yes. And Vice Chairman Preston? Yes. In the consent judgment, the case to be continued was also included and therefore no separate actions will be necessary. Mr. Chairman, that was not included in the consent agenda, so you would need a, a motion to continue right. that case, please. Then, in the matter of what's the case, uh, case number 22100 dash, uh, no, that's not it. Mr. Vice Chair. Yes. I move that we continue case 22-200-08, rezoning Midwest Custom Automotive Group 9304 East US 40 Highway to the July 26th Planning Commission meeting. Do we have a second? I second. Ms. Booth and second. Staff will call the roll. Commissioner Ferguson? Yes. Commissioner Michelle? Yes. Commissioner Nesbitt? Yes. Commissioner Wiley? Yes. Commissioner Young? Yes. And Chairman Preston, or Vice Chairman Preston? Yes. So moved, so carried. In the matter of case number 22100-05 rezoning, 8712 East Winter Road from having previously been heard. Staff, will you report? Okay. Um, as you recall from last week, or not last week, two weeks ago, um, this is a property located on the city limit split between Independence and um, um, Kansas City, Missouri at the intersection of uh, Blue Ridge and uh, 24 highway uh, the applicant is asking to rezone it from c2 to c3 to permit um, heavy um, auto repair mainly for the cabs uh, of um, diesel trucks so um, the former history of the zoning you see it was residential in the past but um, um, from the la for the last 30 years, it's been commercial. Um, so we had shown that the comprehensive plan um, indicated this greater area around the neighborhood to be envisioned for residential, and there are, in fact, some residences that lie to uh, the northeast. And so you can see how the, the existing zoning around there is reflects that and of course you have um, some other commercial across the street as we had noted and and behind and this um, shows a picture of the site a site that is uh, unimproved as far as its surface that that um, that the main building and front door are up uh, very close to the right away at 24 in Independence in that uh, metal building there that um, was an addition of what had been once uh, two buildings next to each other um, that recently had been torn down that was located to the east of there and that um, vehicular access to the storage area parking area is from Kansas City uh, via a, um, a paved or unpaved uh, surface uh, leading into um, back behind the building. And again, this is the drawing that they had um, submitted, uh, giving an idea of uh, what the area looks like and the layout of, 
of what they plan to do um, in front of the metal building and parking and whatnot. And to refresh uh, everyone, this is the building you know, looking eastward. Um, you've got uh, residential uses uh, there to the east on the north side of 24 Highway. And you can see how that fence, solid existing fence, surrounds this property and, and hides that um, interior parking and storage area within this building. And of course, we're looking in the Kansas City part of the property, looking to the west here, looking to the west toward 435. That's Blue Ridge going to the south up the hill. And um, there's some businesses in Kansas City. And then, of course, this business is in Independence directly across the street. And this is looking back toward Independence again, so. Again, um, we had staff recommended that this not be approved. And um, I think uh, Rick has a little bit more he'd like to ask. Question. Uh, I think in the interim between the previous meeting and this one, there was to be some substantial discussion between staff and the applicant. And by the way, is the applicant here? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Vice Chair. The um, Chairman McLean had asked staff to um, research the ideal of adding conditions to a rezoning. And um, we did do that. We, we talked with our council in regards to that. And um, I did send out kind of a, a sheet that kind of explained, kind of walk through it. I'll just kind of briefly cover it. Um, the question of legally, can you put a condition on a rezoning? And so the, the short answer to that is yes, you could. However, there are some challenges with that. And so the challenges are essentially, uh, if you put a condition on a rezoning, the intent would therefore be, let's say this commission does approve that for recommendation, it goes to council, council approves that, that property would then be a different zoning. So in this case, it would go from a C2 to a C3. If the applicant, for example, was not able to meet those conditions or chose not to meet those conditions, the only recourse a city really would have is a city-initiated rezoning to take it back to a C2 because those conditions were not met. That is a little bit, a little bit of a cumbersome process to do that. Um, and again, not necessarily any guarantees that it could go back. Um, the other issue could be if the applicant were to follow through and, and, and follow through with the conditions. Um, and let's say in five years, it's, it's still a C3 zone property. Um, and I know the applicant had talked about keeping this property, but you know we can assume that uh, in the future, there's always things that can happen. It may change, may change hands, may be a different property owner, may be a new tenant. Um, and that tenant may want to have a use that is allowed in any of the C3 districts, then that way it would not meet the conditions that were approved. And so uh, if the city attempted to go back to do a, uh, a city-initiated rezoning back to a C2, we could have some issues and some problems with that if an applicant perhaps bought the property knowing that it was a C3 and feeling that they had the, the right to do any kind of use within the C3 district. And so, can you put a condition on it? The answer would be yes, but is there practical difficulties in, in actually enforcing that condition? And the answer would be yes also. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So for staff's perspective, we wouldn't recommend doing that. And so, just because there, there's a lot of pitfalls that come into that. And you know what, what kind of legalities would the city have in trying to force a rezoning in the future? So <clears throat> with that, we've kind of looked at, okay, what is the criteria that really needs to be considered with this application? So this application is a rezoning application. And so it is our recommendation that you consider 
this application based on the appropriateness of that C3 district and on this property. And so the next question would be, well, what kind of guidance do we have to make that decision? Um, so lack of a better document, really, it is our 2018 comprehensive plan. Um, understand, too, that that plan does reference other plan documents, 24 Highway Corridor, Nolan Road Corridor, uh, Winter and, and Truman Road, and, and various other ones as well. And so we have to kind of take on, um, you know, we have to look at that and see how those plans were actually developed. Um, you know, they were developed in cooperation with the public, elected officials, uh, steering committees, um, you know, staff, uh, you know, everybody that actually took place uh, or took part of those uh, particular plans, um, you know, is there validity in those plans still? Yes, we know that on the granular level, each particular lot may not always make sense sometimes, but is the intent or the wholeness of that particular report still valid? So for staff's perspective, we do feel that it is. Uh, one of those plans obviously is a 24 highway plan. The 24 highway plan does talk about this particular section of 24 highway at Winter Road as being one of the gateways into the city. Um, and you know, the question is, even though it may not be something that happens anytime soon, is that plan for what the gateway of 24 highway should be in the 2040 comprehensive plan still valid? Um, so staff's perspective is that it still is. So then that leads to the next question of, you know, that's the path that we're on now with this application. So is there an alternative? And so there, there is an alternative um, if this commission were to see fit to recommend it. Uh, that alternative would be a PUD rezoning application. Now in the PUD rezoning application, the, this commission could allow, and this is allowed by code, a use in the current zoning district that would not normally be allowed. So if this commission collectively felt that this particular use uh, is appropriate for this site, uh, the applicant go, could go through that process. Now, what is the difference? Well, the difference is, is that that is a PUD, and so the applicant would be responsible for providing a uh, surveyed site plan. That site plan would then come before this commission as a preliminary development plan. You could put conditions on that um, to the heart's desire, and then that applicant would then be responsible for bringing forward all the engineering that would be required to fulfill that preliminary development plan, and then it would be administratively approved as a final development plan, and then the applicant can move forward with their project. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. If this commission was not comfortable with the C3 zoning, which does open it up to a lot of other uses that may not be desirable um, you know, within that 2040 plan, but it does allow this applicant to use that use um, under that PUD. And so, uh, so that would be a recommendation that we could, you know, offer this commission. If they so choose to de desire to do that, they can uh, ask the applicant if they're willing to follow through with that process. Now, in terms of technicality-wise, uh, we would just convert this particular application to a PUD rezoning application. Um, but the applicant would have to understand that there would be some cost in providing that preliminary development plan, which is essentially be a site plan that shows the building, the, the site improvements, the stormwater improvements, parking lot, and any other particular engineering that would have to be approved. Point of clarification. Will the applicant be required to do anything in this potential PUD in classification zoning C2 that would not be required in a C3 zoning? So the answer to that is if, let's say for example, it was already a C3, mm -hmm. they would still have to provide that information even as part of the business license. So the business license process opens up the inspections of the building, the inspections of the site, staff would then tell the applicant or the applicant's tenant here's what you're going to have to do to be able to do this use. And if that means you'd have to provide 
building permits, that means you'd have to provide building permits. If you have to provide a site plan, um, you know, stormwater mitigation, um, building fire improvements, environmental improvements, all that would still be required even if this was already a C3. In anticipating Mr. Saida's question, you're from the government, you're here to help him. I know he is thinking there has to be a hook here. There must be something because why would he get in a C2 what he originally saw in a rezoning of a C3? So the catch is with a PUD, it is what you see is what you get. So that plan is what it is. So let's say for the future, 10 years from now, it's being used as this heavy automotive use. It can continue to be that. If, for example, let's say that he were to sell the property and they wanted to do something else. Maybe they wanted to do a medical marijuana manufacturing, which would be allowed <laughs> under a, typically under a C3. It would then just default back to the C2 zoning because it's still a C2. So really the catch is it can only be used for that use. And then, of course, the, the cost of providing some of that up front versus later with the, with the survey and the site plan that has to come before this commission. I know. Commissioner Michelle is about to ask the question. Um, so if, if, if we, if it reverts back to a C2, all, all that really means is, you know, that that would have to be disclosed to a new tenant or a new buyer that either it stays as a semi automotive as approved without changes to the site plan, or it's, it's going to, it's going to revert back to the original zoning and Correct. The use is allowed. It would always be a C2. It would always be a C2. It would always be a C2. So any, any new owner would have to be aware that this business as it currently is, is allowed. Mm -hmm. But if you ever change it, then you're falling under the C2 zoning requirements. So it, you know, even though this use was a C3 use, it's still a C2 property. Okay, so in clarifying, more than likely the improvements that are gonna be required um, in order to satisfy uh, the PUD, the site plan, paving the lot, stormwater mitigation, et cetera, et cetera. Those would all result in building permits. Build, building permits require the engineered, you know, drawings. Um, so again, we're those things. Those things would still be required. Correct. Yeah, they're going to be required either way, mm -hmm. um, because whether it's enforced through the business license, if you were to choose just to convert it to a C three, it would still be required. Okay. So if um, so, there there potentially is a bit of risk. For Mr. Sayeda here because he could be entering into an agreement with this tenant tentatively based on approval of the PUD. Approval of the PUD, we've got to get the preliminary development plan here, which doesn't require a ton of engineering. It's preliminary. Correct. We could review and approve it. Correct. The, uh, in the meantime, um, you know, you could go through a bunch of these sorts of engineer drawings, get everything ready. If the tenant would, were to pull out, after that process, he's, those, those are sunk cost at this Correct. point for him. Correct. Um, because otherwise it would be, we're going to convert to a C3. He's going to sign a lease with the tenant. The tenant's going to come in and uh, then take on that, that burden. So some of the burden is then shifted to him in this case, correct? Tenant, yeah, depending I, I on would the, the say it would depend. Agreement. Yeah, I would say it would depend on how the applicant, wants to handle you it. know, has, wants to handle that with the tenant. So my original question related to if we were to condition it to a C3, they, they, they did everything they needed to do, the, the use changed, the tenant changed, sold the property, and then the city had to undergo a forced rezoning. What is your enforcement mechanism to, to at that point? You've, you've taken well, it back from a C3 to a C2. How do, you, well, how do you make things right? That's the question. So could the... Well, that, that, that's the very question. So you could, we could bring it, basically what we would do is we'd bring it before this commission to have it revert back to the C2 zoning. And then eventually, it is, assuming it would be approved by council, then it would go through council. But uh, the real so question becomes... Community development? 
enforcement related issue at that point? Like a well, and see, that's the thing. We don't have a tracking mechanism for conditions on zonings, rezonings. So, you know, let's say five years from now, somebody on staff would just have to remember that there were conditions on this property that this use was the only allowed use. And so then we would have to somehow keep track of that um, and then notify perhaps the new owner that you can't do other uses in the C3 because that was conditioned five years ago for only this use. Um, does that open us up for you know, legal challenge? I mean, I, I, that, that's the question. Um, could we do it? I think we could, but we, we may be opening ourselves up to something. That's all I had. Commissioner. So if we go the PUD route, that can't be done tonight. That's a continuation. Correct. It would right. have to be a recommendation by this commission to the applicant that you recommend them follow the PUD um, application process. And so they would then, we, we would work with them on, really it's just converting this application to a PUD application and then letting them know what they need to submit to fulfill that application. But then yes, it would have to be a future meeting. Commissioner Young. When you say extra costs associated with a PUD application, are those minimal or what kind of additional costs? Does well, it vary or? Like I said, the application is, there, there would be no change in the, we would just use the same application essentially just convert it over. But the applicant would have to understand that they would have to you know, whether they do it or the tenant pays for it, they would have to then submit that preliminary development plan to us that we bring before this commission. Um, so that's really the the cost, I guess you would say. Um, really, it would, be the, it would be the cost of hiring an engineer to prepare yes. the preliminary development plan and then do the final development plan. Yes, now, even if, even if let's say for example it was C3, they would still have to pay for the engineering drawings, yeah. um, but they wouldn't necessarily have to have a preliminary development plan per se. It would be a different, like a page document, so they would be paying separate for that page document that has the preliminary development plan on it. Commissioner, you have a question? All right. <laughs> it appears that uh, the commissioners are understanding Let's hear from the applicant. Commission, uh, Mr. Saida, would you please state your name, address? Joseph Saida. I live at 10606 North Willow Avenue, Liberty, Missouri. Thank you. We've been rather deliberate so that you would get to hear this repeated. As best as you can, do you understand all that's been developed and what is being proposed by the city. I do. And your your perception is? Well, the only perception, I mean, it, it's probably going to cost at least $5,000 for the plan that he's talking about, which, which is going to be a huge undertaking, but uh, that, that's probably my biggest uh, proponent to it. Substantially, and if I heard staff correctly, you were going to under encounter these costs anyway. I think what is the additional cost that would be palatable to the staff and pro most probably also this commission would be the cost for the development of that page. If, if that's what it takes to get me through, I guess I, I, I'm okay. Thank you. As a matter of order, is there anyone here that would like to speak in favor of this plan? Is there anyone who would take exceptions to what is being presented? Vice Staff, Chair. do you have a point of further clarification? Yes, I was going to say, Vice Chair. Uh, so you, you do still have the rezoning application before you, so um, you can 
either choose to vote on that or choose to continue this and ask you know and ask the applicant if they're willing to change that application process. If we are going to recommend for continuation, we would not be able to decide an actual date. And like in the past, we've we've said this case would be continued to a certain date. In this case, we're going to recommend the PUD process and for it to be continued until that application that, is ready. That would be correct. We, we wouldn't really know a time right now. For the record, that would be a motion to postpone indefinitely until um, the, the preparations have been put together. As Mr. Arroyo pointed out, before you this evening is an application to rezone from C2 to C3. That, that is the matter you can decide. Um, and you can either vote yes or no uh, on that. If the applicant would rather suggest that they would be willing to undertake the PUD process as opposed to going forward with the rezoning to C2 or C3, that's essentially a, another option, but that's really something that the applicant should bring forward as opposed to, to the commission from that standpoint, because what you, you, you have to vote in, for what is in front of you at this point. So Thank you, Councilor. Mr. Seider, would you come forward, please? Yes, sir. What is your request of this commission? Would you choose to go the route of the PUD, or would you have this commission vote on the application as presented? I have a question first. Uh, I know you're talking about a bunch of expense here to do the PUD. Basically, what I see in common sense wise, your property, the building is on Independence, the parking lot's on Kansas City. If they stay at C2, he can get a permit to do a business there, correct, staff? He can do an automotive business there because that's, is that correct? Uh, on the Kansas City side, is that what you're talking about? No, I'm talking on the Independence side, that's where the building's at. It would have to be a C2 automotive use. Well, that's what I'm saying. He gets a C2 automotive. There's nothing to stop him from putting that semi on the other side and doing the work, correct? Correct, on the Kansas City side. Yeah, so I'm saying that he's probably going to relate back to the C2 and not worry about this and just get the permits. What I'm saying, that's going to be his least, least costly way. So I'm just saying, Joe, that sounds like to me what you're probably going to end up doing to get a tenant in there. I mean, that's probably what I would do because that's a common sense way to do it. Because there's no way for us to stop him from working on a semi on the other side. Kansas City could do it, but Independence cannot. And that, and Kansas that's, City's already said they will allow it. They will allow it. So yeah. Kansas City's already allowed it. So that's why I'm saying I would recommend that we just dismiss this case, let him go apply for a C2, and let them do business as that because that's the only way it's going to happen. That's my opinion. The, if I understand correctly, about 80%, 90% of the building where the work would be done is in independence. Yes. Then the, the answer is rather obvious that in order to operate, you're going to be operating in independence the preponderance yes. of the time. And therefore, so as to not encumber the normal operations in what otherwise would be a C3 zoning, this PUD would permit that. You know, for, for the sake of doing it correctly and doing it the right way in independence, I, I will do the PUD if, they, if they'll do it. I do need to get it done as soon as possible if we can meet with this next week. Yeah, we can certainly do it. Okay. I would be happy to do that. I, I want to do it correctly. I'm trying to trying to do the right thing in independence, even though I do understand exactly what you said, sir. Yes. We'll take a motion for a continuance. I have a question for Councilor. Oh, go ahead. Um, so to clarify, the motion that needs to be made is, is really to vote on what's in front of us on the agenda. Or can we vote for a postponement? At yes. this point, you can vote for a postponement. The, I wanted to make sure it was the applicant's wish to make a decision to switch the type of application at this stage of the game. So at this point, I've heard the applicant say they would be willing to pursue the PUD. At this point, what I would suggest is that this, this commission 
would postpone consideration of, of this matter indefinitely. That would allow the applicant to work with staff to revise the application itself. And the next application that you would see come before you would no longer be a rezoning from C2 to C3, but instead a C2 uh, PUD uh, set up for that particular use. Mr. Vice so, Chair, I move that we uh, move case 22-100-05 rezoning 8712 East US 24 Highway Winter Road, uh, it, that we move it indefinitely. Postpone. It's a motion Post to postpone motion consideration to postpone indefinitely. Consideration indefinitely. We have a a second. We have a motion and a second. Staff, would you call the roll? Commissioner Ferguson. Yes. Commissioner Michelle. Yes. Commissioner Nesbitt. Yes. Commissioner Wiley. Yes. Commissioner Young. Yes. And Vice Chairman Preston. Yes. This motion is carried. The case has been continued, postponed indefinitely. Next case is a continued case 22100-06, rezoning at 13001 East U.S. Highway 40. Staff? Yes, this is an application by Joe Bartels II to rezone some property at 13. 1001 East 40 Highway. Uh, <clears throat> he seeks to rezone this property from C1 and C2 to C3. The vicinity map shows its location. It's on 40 Highway, just west of the uh, the, the turn or whatever. Some, I've heard some people call it the turn. Uh, as you can see on the map, it previously was, if you're familiar with 40 Highway, an AMF Strike and Spare Bowling Center. <clears throat> this is the surrounding zonings for the property. As you can see in the uh, blue polygon there, the, uh, the lighter pink is the C1, while the uh, darker red is the C2. We don't really know what the, uh, why it was zoned that way. Uh, from what we understand, the entire property was zoned, going back to the 1965 map, the entire property was zoned a mixture of C1 and C3, and then on the 1980 map, which is to present, it was C1 and C2. There were a number of uh, properties that were zoned C3 that when they changed the, the zoning ordinance in 1980, they just became C2 uses. And that's what we assume that happened here. Why it's shaped like that, we don't have any information on. Sorry. Uh, as you can see, north of there, the properties are zoned uh, C1, again, the light pink, and then red is the C2 zoning, kind of a mixed bag along there. South, it's pretty much all residential. Uh, that's uh, <clears throat> Fort Hees Vale, directly across the street to the south. It's zoned as R1 PUD, I believe, excuse me, R6 PUD. This is the comprehensive plan. P plan recommends uh, residential uses for this entire area, except for uh, west, excuse me, east of there, which is part of the uh, Nolan Fashion Square, which I think we're looking for some sort of business park project there. This is the aerial photograph that shows the uh, site. Again, you can see the uh, property's kind of odd shape. There's been uh, little properties cut out of this from uh, a number of years ago. Just north of the building, which sits on the southeast corner, there's a used little used car lot there. And then in the northwest corner, there's a, that was a restaurant at one time. I think it's still a restaurant or a bar. Okay, like I said, the current zone history is it was C1 and C2 and how it was changed. Uh, some of the property's history, uh, we, the most information we can get this strike and spare did receive a business license 64 until it closed in 18. Uh, there's some evidence that it was in location there before that, uh, that it was actually in operation before that, uh, but I, uh, that's all the information that we have. And then the applicant purchased this property in uh, 2020 and has used it for his flooring sales and 
uh, sales and installation business and also his contracting company. <clears throat> this is the concept plan for the uh, site he has provided. Again, you can see the building in the lower right-hand corner, which is southeast corner. It's kind of odd-shaped. It goes all the way to the property line on the south. And then the rest of the property is actually parking lot. If you've been out there, you've lots of parking out there. Uh, he plans his tentative concept plan shows the area on the uh, extreme west side of the property to be a row of uh, shipping containers uh, down the west property line and some on the north property line. The fence that's shown around the, uh, this drawing is actually incorrect. The fence will go across the site and connect up to the building or it'll be enclosed. That whole area will be enclosed in the fencing uh, for contractors to use their, use its property for their uh, interior, to, you know, their materials and certain equipment, and then also to use the exterior part of the property as uh, parking for their backhoes or, you know, cherry picker trucks or that sort of thing. <clears throat> Some analysis for the project. Again, the comprehensive plan does recommend... Uh, it does support rec uh, the re redevelopment of the commercial corridors. Staff doesn't feel this rezoning qu request would be considered a re redevelopment project as the applicant is seeking to add ship containers as an additional use on the site. Comprehensive plan recommends residential neighborhoods for the site. That This rezoning is inconsistent with that. Uh, then the zoning for the property is C1 is intended to provide smaller retail light service uses, such as uh, barber shops, offices, sit-down restaurants, dog grooming, daycare, so forth. The other current use is C2. It's intended to serve a wider market. Um, it permits gas convenience stores, hospitals, taverns, drive through restaurants, light automotive repair, hotel contracting services without outdoor storage. And then the requested rezoning is C3, allows for warehousing, light manufacturing, heavy general and heavy uh, vehicle repair, which relates to the last case you were just discussing, uh, medical marijuana testing, contractors' offices with outdoor storage, recycling, and then it also prohibits uh, various light uh, service, you know, hair salons, food and beverage, taverns, things like that. Oh, okay, on the uh, analysis, we also looked at uh, some environmental and stormwater situations. Uh, water pollution control indicated that the uh, contractor's area, if it's limited to equipment and materials being kept primarily inside the containers, they're not so concerned about that. However, if machinery and equipment is stored outside, it must be serviced off-site, and the on-site repair and washout of the equipment is prohibited. Because if, if you've been out there and you'll see in the pictures, it's all paved, so the water would run to the south because that's the way the property slopes. Um, the proposed, the contractor's plan is conceptual. Well, it probably will be modified in shape and size. The permits will be required for fencing, lighting inside the fenced area, and perhaps tie downs for the shipping containers. And no water, sanitary sewer, or electrical services will be provided. <clears throat> Okay, this is, uh, we're starting on the north. Uh, this is the uh, um, sign that's along 40 Highway. It used to say AMF uh, Strike and Spare Bowling Center. Here, this is the front of the building that used to be the main doors for the, for the center. You can see he's got his sign on the uh, canopy there, and then to the right, his other two businesses that are in there. This is uh, further back. It shows part of the parking lot of the location. And here we're down along uh, 40, uh, <clears throat> 42nd Street and looking to the northwest, excuse me, to the northeast. Again, you can see the parking lot area in the building. They have blocked off the uh, uh, drive connections onto 42nd Street, 47th Street, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, for the time being, I think when they, when they open this business up, those will go away and they'll be able to use that. Here is another part of the parking lot. This is actually looking to the northwest. 
Uh, this will be some of the area that they use for this business. Here's another shot of that parking area that's on the west to northwest side. Again, this is the driveway that is partially blocked off. And here is the property that's to the west that shows the, uh, I think it was a Ken's Pizza at one time or something. Right there is now a bar, and then there's a car wash off in the distance. Here we're looking west down 40 Highway. There's actually some commercial property that's uh, to the northwest. You can see it down there in the distance. This is a car lot directly across 40 Highway to the north. Here we're looking east up 40 Highway. Um, here's the pizza place whose name escapes me at the time. is right down the street there. This is the car lot that's one of the cutouts uh, of this property. And here we're down along 47th Street. We're looking to the east, up East 47th Street. These, uh, this is some of the duplexes that back up to 47th Street. Part of the Voorhees Vale subdivision has been finished for probably four or five years now. These are all duplexes along here. You can see another picture of them. The developer uh, provided a, a good amount of screening, a berm, and then some trees and so forth along the along the property line there. <clears throat> and here, looking west down East 47th Street, here's another commercial business down here that uh, does some sort of recovery center. That's been there a number of years also. SAP does not recommend uh, approval of this rezoning for the following reasons. It's not in conformance with the comprehensive plan designation for the area. It's close approximately to the residential property south of East 47th Street. And the applicant's requested C3 zoning would allow a much broader array of uses, particularly intensive commercial and like industrial type uses, than just the proposed shipping container and equipment storage yard. I have cause to think that maybe because of precedence of the previous case that the city has done some additional work. Is it, uh, would you like to proceed with that? Well, what I was going to say is, um, you know, this is very similar to the last case. Um, although we haven't had direct, um, communication with the applicant on, on that, um, this could also be considered in, in the same manner if, if the commission so chose to. Uh, but again, it's, a, it's another situation of, is C3 appropriate for this area? Commissioner? Yes. Uh, Going on down, is that industrial where the old Sutherlands is? Is that industrial, that zone? Hang I'm on trying to figure out the go back code. that. You don't have a picture of it, I don't think. Um, yes, I, well, it shows, uh, yeah. It appears that little area that is in independence, and not very much of it is in independence, it appears to be zoned uh, industrial. That is industrial zone. In yeah, that it's area. that gray area that you can see. Yeah, that gray area. That's why I was wondering. Because, I mean, there's semis and stuff in there right now. That's why I was trying to figure out if that's industri zone industrial or not. And But that's not independence. That's Kansas City? Well, only the gray part is. Only the gray part. And then it goes right into uh, okay. Kansas City. Back part to Kansas City. Then. That's right. Okay. Mr. Borders, is there a possibility that that could be a business park or a business park PUD there? You mean where the applicant seeks to do where this? Where Mr. Mr. Nesmith is asking. The, the uh, well, it's not really, I believe it's not really that big. It's only. Uh, yeah, it's on the other side of the railroad track. So I don't it's uh, the property it's size of the applicant's yeah, property is. Southern. That's about 16 acres in there. Yeah, okay. The applicant's property is about three acres. So. Is the old Sam's Club where Bennett Packaging is going. Is that Kansas City or is that? That's it? all in Kansas City. Kansas City. That's an area we only get the first 200 feet along 40 Highway. Let's hear from the applicant and then I, I think we want staff probably to come back and expand upon 
what you did previously in the earlier case. Mr. Bartell? State your name, address, and your vision as you see it, and exactly what is being proposed here. Uh, Joseph Bartels the second. I live at 412 Southwest Eagles Ridge Drive in Blue Springs, Missouri. Um, the, the biggest, what I'm trying to propose is a secure area for contractors to use for storage. We won't, ha we won't be washing any equipment. There's not going to be any water, no electricity. They'll have a solar powered light in each container. Um, but th the biggest goal is to give us a secure place. With me having a, a Class A contractor's license and a commercial construction company, there's not a secure place really local uh, to where we can keep equipment, products, and stuff like that. I literally have three trailers inside of the building right now uh, because I've already had three stolen and a truck within the past year. So my goal is just to uh, create a, a secure place for storage for myself and other contractors that I do a lot of work with. And you understand the C3 zoning and the expanded possibilities there. I do. Uh, I, I would be interested in a PUD with conditions or whatever if that's an option. All right. Why don't, why don't you do a more expanded presentation and offer what can be done via a PUD within a C2 zoning, which means, counselor, you might want to, we got a C1 and a C2, a possibility of a PUD, just, just make note. Rick, you want to go ahead? And so, Mr. Bartell, would you just remain with us? I mean, I guess the first thing I would say is if the commission feels that they want to recommend staff to work with the applicant on a PUD, we could do that. Um, as far as staff is concerned, in terms of what we would look at, I mean, obviously we would be expecting not something that's just shipping containers. We would be expecting some more substantial site improvements um, as well as, you know, some kind of building as opposed to um, these outdoor storage containers. So I, I kind of want to be careful in how I word that because I don't want to necessarily make the applicant feel that that would be some kind of guarantee of an approval. But at the same time, if that's the wish of the commission to, to work with the applicant, you know, in that manner, we could do so. Uh, but as I said, I, I think in terms of staff's recommendation, um, obviously we don't recommend it as it is right now, um, but we would, have, we would have the expectations that it would be substantial site improvements. Mr. Bartel. Uh, Vice Chair. Question here for staff. Rick, we just talked about the storage. Is storage not C2 or is that C3? So that is allowing a indoor storage with a special use permit in a C2 district. How that would apply in this situation, and I don't believe that's been final approved yet, um, but again, that was with the intention that there was an existing building on a site that would be converted to some sort of indoor storage. Right. And so this would end up either being just a regular outdoor storage or the applicant would have to propose some kind of indoor storage in the C2 zoning district, uh, which would again require substantial site improvements, um, including a building. Right. So. Okay, thanks Rick. Commissioners, any further questions about commissioners? Mr. Bartel. Uh, si since I've owned it in 2020, we've already put $220,000 in renovations in it, and uh, our business is at a 235% growth. Um, so 
I mean, it, it represents me as a company. If you, whatever you guys want, I don't really care. Uh, the <laughs> biggest thing is, is I work really hard for everything that I have, and the the Jackson County doesn't prosecute theft. So, I'm just trying to keep what I've worked hard for. It would appear that if we were to, if we were to continue this, then you would work with the Planning Commission staff. Yeah. And with that coordinated effort, perhaps then you would come back before this commission with a modified application. Is that what you would like to do? Yes, sir. Counselor, your thoughts and guidance here? I think obviously the, this, there's much similarity between this case and the previous case. I think I wish I had said during the previous case, but I will restate it now, that keep in mind that this commission, whether it was these people on the commission or not, this commission is responsible for creating the comprehensive plan of the City of Independence. It's the guidance for where zoning decisions are supposed to go. I can't speak to this particular area, whether that was part of the zoning plan that I heard in the last application that was adopted in 2018, but if, we, if it were, then I would say this commission just four years ago set a course and said that between that time and 2040, we would be moving from commercial uses to residential uses on the first one. I can't tell you whether that was four years ago on this one because I don't know if that was the same plan that applies, but either way, the Planning Commission has adopted a comprehensive plan that says that this property was to go towards residential. Both of these applications were taking it the other direction, right. making it more intensified use instead of less, which is contrary to the plan that this commission creates. That being said, to, to vote, you know, again, like the last application, this application is a request to zone from C1, C2 to a C3 in that direction, okay? If there is an ability for the applicant to work with staff to come up with a different approach that would maybe potentially limit it to a particular use and would keep it from being moved to a C3 zoning for potentially decades to come, that's a good solution in my book as long as the applica applicant is okay with it as well. It would be the same uh, motion to postpone indefinitely to give the applicant the opportunity to work with staff to come up with a revised application. Thank you, Councilman. Got a question? Commissioner? As a matter of order, I think we strayed from order a bit. Do we want to invite anybody who wants to speak for or against and then allow us to have some discussion? I think we can do that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Partail. Thank you. And I, yep. uh, I apologize for my chuckle. It was just thinking of any comprehensive plan that would see this area of independence as residential is a little funny. That's all. It's what this commission approved, though. Yeah, no, I absolutely. But, thank, thank you, Commissioner. Yeah. Is there anyone here who would like to speak in favor of this application? Hearing none. Is there anyone here who would be speaking in opposition to this application. Hearing none, we'll close this public portion of this uh, hearing and allow the commissioners the opportunity to discuss this matter. Uh, uh, if I may, um, the project as proposed, in my viewpoint, is not compatible with the comprehensive plan for, for sure, but definitely not the, the current state of 40 Highway. I look at Sutherland's, I look at Bennett Packaging as a bit of an aberration um, in the area. It's neighborhood commercial, it's small shops, it's uh, hair salons, barber shops, restaurants, car washes, used car lots. It's not a 3C zone, 3C3 zoning area. So I, I do not view it as compatible with the neighborhood now, especially looking at the, the those nicer uh, patio homes, duplexes, what, whatnot to the south. Um, I certainly do not see the, the project proposed, as proposed, being a good neighbor. Um, I would advocate for it to go, to postpone, 
to let them work with staff to see if they can find a solution that staff can bring to us with a recommendation for approval. Because until I see a recommendation for approval from staff, I'm, I'm going to be reluctant to want to take any action on this. Counselor, I mean, Park Tech. Hmm. I think that's good counsel. Anyone else with the uh, um, comments here? Now, I know what the guy's trying to do, keep his stuff from getting stolen. The thing is, he's going about it probably a little bit wrong by putting containers. Containers don't look good sitting out on the street. If you go up and look in Liberty, they got a nice place that's called for workers to put their stuff inside. It's chained, it's gated, it's something like that. And I'm thinking that's what he's probably looking for doing. I would suggest maybe he go look around and see what's around and maybe bring back a proposal that looks something a little better like that. That's what I would probably recommend. Commissioner? I agree. Commissioner Young? In, in light of... I make a motion. Okay. In, in, in light of the desire of the applicant to meet with the staff for further discussion, I think we can entertain a, a motion in that regard. I make a motion that we... I mean, I never heard anybody say this, but I make a motion that we decline this application, case 221006. Only approve that well I can say. You can only make a motion in the affirmative. Okay. So then I make, I make either a we either we're gonna make a motion that we I, that I we make can a vote motion on that we vote on it and that way it we can either deny it or approve it. Uh, do you do you not feel that there is merit to allow them to work with staff to see if there is a do he can go back and do it again a different way. I mean not less it will cost him more maybe I guess I don't know what that that changes that. Well, if it goes to the city council, it will, and it's denied by the council, or even withdrawn by the applicant, it'll ha he'll have to wait a certain time period before he can reapply. Okay, so it's better off than we postpone. Okay. And I'll I would assume there's an application fee of some sort that if, it, that's if the correct. case were terminated, then a new application would be produced as opposed to postponing would okay, allow that to be held until the revision is brought forward. Okay, I'll make a motion that 22100 dash 06 rezoning at 13001 East 40 Highway be postponed indefinitely. Do we have second. A second. We have a motion. We have a second. Staff, call the roll. Commissioner Ferguson? Yes. Commissioner Michelle? Yes. Commissioner Nesbitt? Yes. Commissioner Wiley? Yes. Commissioner Young? Yes. Vice Chair Preston? Yes case has been postponed indefinitely. Ms. Mr. Bartell, you'll work with the city staff and see what you can get done. Thank you. In the matter of case number 22-125-08, rezoning at uh, 2610 and 2612 South Lee Summit Road, we appear to have a full house. I am not at all surprised. Uh, staff, can you give us a report on this case? I'm going to have to get this up and running here. So case 22-125-08 is uh, two um, tracts of land at 2610 and 2612 South, Lee Summit Road, right across from the Glendale Elementary School, as you can see from the vicinity map that we have right here. Um, the applicant is asking, these two tracts are zoned C1, and R6 right now, and the applicant's asking for it to be rezoned to R18 PUD in order to uh, build a um, multifamily development. Uh, current zoning, um, like I said, is R1, um, neighborhood commercial, and R6. Former zonings prior to 1980, from 1965 forward, um, was under the old R1 
a single family residential um, classification system. And then um, between 80 and 2009, um, we had the refinement of that R1. It was called an R1B, at least for one of the tracks. The other one on the south, that abuts the drum farm development is actually since 1980 had been had been zoned CP1 planned neighborhood commercial and and since the um, um, latest UDO or since the creation of the UDO is now simply C1. Um, so these tracks have have been undeveloped for decades, basically. Uh, there's an old farmhouse on the northern one, um, basically fields that have been either hayed or under cultivation or under different agricultural uses for the past couple decades until more recently being just mowed fields. Um, uh, the property had been has been in possession of the uh, Inglewood Assembly of God for... Um, some decades now uh, with the intention that the tracks would be the location for a church and um, plans changed so apparently did not happen. Um, going through the analysis section here, um, this um, this plan is consistent with the strategic plan um, to, to um, achieve livability and um, healthy and um, uh, quality environments. Uh, the comprehensive land use plan, um, the guiding principles therein, um, the ones that uh, most um, um, are most compatible to, with this use or, or the envision of um, a walkable neighborhood um, and also to provide a, a diversity of housing options within neighborhoods and this would be a, a, um, a different housing option than, than um, the others immediately surrounding um, currently. So, as you can see, the comprehensive plan is um, residential everywhere around here. Um, so, the, the, the commercial, um, there is in the zoning, there it's the zoning, um, is sort of an oddity um, within the neighborhood. Um, in the applicant proposes R18 PUD zoning. R8 PUD zoning allows uh, multifamily housing, uh, home-based daycare, uh, government facilities, churches, schools, um, cemeteries, crops, gardening, um, similar to the North Tracks current zoning of... Um, um, R6, except for that's uh, more is dedicated to um, single family instead of uh, multifamily uses. And uh, of course, C1 um, is for small scale uh, retail uses um, and small support services and restaurants, even in banks and medical facilities, personal improvement services. And here's an aerial photograph of that area. You can see the house is is up um, closest close to the road and up in that northernmost part of of um, the lot. And then the property's flanked by trees along um, its fence line, um, particularly thicker um, there in the west. Um, the tracks are. Otherwise, fairly flat. Um, 
and the property is neither in the floodplain nor anywhere um, in near um, our stream. So there are no need to consider uh, this, the UDO's buffer zone requirements. Um, of course, um, building permits and the phasing aspect of this um, property. Uh, given the proposed development will be a rental community um, cited on on t uh, one or two lots and we would suggest they plat it as one lot um, const constructed in two phases um, permits for um, each structure in a particular phase will uh, will uh, be submitted around the same time. Uh, the development's first phase, uh, the two-story units with garages near Lee Summit Road, and the one-story units in the middle of the development will be constructed first. The remainder of the two-story units with garages will be constructed in the second phase. That's beyond um, the central portion that has the cluster in, around in that curve and going off to that, that cul-de-sac um, at the rear. Elevations, um, whether they are um, uh, four or three or two unit buildings, the applicant proposes just two styles of structure. Um, a two-story two structure or one and a half with a, sort of an a attic with a dormer uh, area um, with garages and then uh, one story um, structure without garages. Um, the two story structures will have dormers above the garages and covered uh, front entries. The one story buildings without garages will have mi mission style entries from adjacent patios, so you won't enter them directly, but um, from the side. Uh, all the facades will be uh, predominantly lap siding, but um, they will need to have uh, four foot tall masonry wing coats that are higher uh, than indicated, or staff believes that's what's needed, that are higher than indicated on these elevations. Uh, further, those wankos should wrap around at least two feet on the sides of the buildings, as well as be present on all right-of-way facing facades. Um, the buildings will have composition shingles, and the units will have uh, two bedrooms. Uh, none of the units will have basements. Um, here's some floor plans. The city's uh, capital improvements plan has a program that Woodbury, uh, a storm water project at Woodbury and 25th Street, uh, just to the northwest of this property. Um, for uh, 2026 and the 2027, uh, this project will uh, address the lack of stormwater facilities in, in that area of the city. <laughs> and uh, the applicant's project uh, will not have any impact on that project. Um, the applicants um, have submitted a traffic study which analyzes the traffic impacts on the surrounding roadway network. Uh, the, the study concluded that the addition of uh, the development traffic will have minimal impact on the existing traffic operations along Lee Summit Road. The analysis indicated that uh, no left turn lanes are warranted at the intersection of South Lee Summit Road and the proposed sites drive. However, a left turn lane into the, into the uh, school is currently warranted and the city's traffic division is recommending striping the left hand turn lane for the entrance to this addition 
as part of the first phase. So that would be a restriping of the existing area within the 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 curbs that are there now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the right of way with its uh, two appendage cul-de-sacs um, will be labeled and, and addressed as one street, a public street built to city standards and having accompanying public sidewalks on both sides. A limited access drive for the use of emergency vehicles will be constructed leading from the street to the northwest corner of the property where it will connect with um, South Trail Ridge Drive, but will be um, gated. Uh, driveways to the units um, accessing the right-of-way will be uh, provided par parking for one car that lead to a, a single garage uh, for parking for another. Uh, the two parking lots provide for units without garages uh, will each provide 36 spaces, uh, two handicap spaces uh, for the 19 and for the, the, the two clusters there, the 19 and the 23 units. Um, you can see the little green dots on, along the roadway here show some of the landscaping. Um, that would, and, and then the darker dots show um, um, some of the proposed buffer along the drum farm development to the south. Um, when the final development plan is submitted, in addition to the street trees indicated on this uh, preliminary development plan, trees and shrubs should be pro provided around the parking lot perimeters and the buildings as indicated in the UDO. The stands of trees abutting the west and the northwest side of the properties uh, appear to already be adequate buffers. Um, along the southern edges of the property, there is some thick landscaping in place, in places. Um, medium intensity landscaping, as defined by the UDO, should be planted uniformly across the, the southern part there. Uh, lastly, along the east side, along the Lee Summit Road right of way, a four foot uh, tall berm should be constructed. So, so we'll go through the pictures real quickly here. And this is, I'm standing in front of Glendale School looking west into the property. So you can see the stand of, the tr stand of trees uh, located um, on the far deep end of the property there, as well as on the northwest as well. This is looking catty-cornered um, from the northeast side of the property of Ugly Summit Road looking to the southwest. So to our left side is, um, is Drum Farm, and you can see some of the thicker cluster that tends to be around that one coldest stack there toward the the corner of the of the property this is looking north um, along lee summit road at the house that's at the very northeast uh, corner of this uh, tract of land and then um, let's see this is this is looking Actually, this is a looking northward from farther south, um, I believe, because there's the entrance to the school is, is a little bit, is in front of that sign that's off to the left there. Um, and here's looking straight across at uh, Glendale Elementary. And then this is the picture looking south. Um, yeah, so drum, the trees sort of buffering drum farm or those ones we see on the right, right there. And then um, you've got the single family development that lies uh, to the southeast here across the roadway. And uh, got a, I think I have the wrong street name here. I think that's Woodbury. 
<laughs> it says Handover. <laughs> this is from Woodbury, looking south, um, where it would, uh, where it intersects with uh, the north end of this property. Um, staff recommends approval of the rezoning and preliminary development plan um, with the following conditions. Um, number one, for the fi for the final development plan. Create a denser landscape buffer along the southern edge of the property. Create a medium intensity landscape buffer per the landscaping section of the Unified Development Ordinance, UDO. Number two, provide a four foot berm along Lee Summit Road. Submit a cross section elevation with a final development plan. Number three, all sidewalks provided must be five foot wide and meet ADA requirements. And number four, provide parking lot perimeter trees and shrubs and shrubs around the buildings. Uh, the exact number of plantings worked out with staff for the final development plan. Uh, number five, the final development plan should provide an elevation of an entry sign or feature. Uh, number six, stripe a left turn lane at the entrance of the proposed development. Number seven, the masonry facades on the front of the elevations of the buildings must be carried for at least two feet around the adjacent side elevations and across all right away facing facades. Uh, number eight, on the final development plan, label the new public right of way east 26 Terrace Court South. Uh, the units will be addressed on the final development plan as well. And um, number nine, uh, prior to the issuance of any um, building permits, um, a replat of the property shall be approved. So that concludes my Thank presentation. You. Thank you. Is the applicant or counsel for the applicant available? Please state your name and address, counselor. Good evening, uh, Mr. Vice Chair and members of the commission. My name is Bill Moore. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Rouse Fretz, White Goss, Gentile Roads, address located at 4510 Bellevue Avenue, Kansas City, Missouri. I'm here tonight on behalf of the co-applicants, uh, O'Loughlin Development LLC and Inglewood Assembly of God Church. I don't have a lot of comments to, to make at this point on, on this, uh, on this uh, proposal. Uh, both of uh, my clients will be coming forward to provide more insight uh, for your benefit uh, in greater detail. But I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. So this is a unique project in the sense that it's a, it's a joint venture, or, black, or in, the, in the sense between a private developer and, and, this, and a church who's owned this property for over 35 years. Uh, Mr. Joseph O'Loughlin uh, has a background in real estate and in aging services. So as Mr. O'Loughlin and Pastor Watkins from Inglewood Church were in communication regarding this uh, development of this property, there became a, uh, a time where there was a meeting of the minds with respect to how this property should be developed. That meeting in the minds was to provide housing opportunities for senior citizens of the, of the city of Independence that currently are, are not available, that being rental housing. Um, it was something that, again, works for um, Mr. O'Loughlin's background and, and his, his expertise. And it also spoke to the the desire of the church in terms of what it wanted to see happen to this property, which it's owned for all these years, um, 
in, in, in an effort to be good stewards of, of, their, of their land. They've had opportunities to sell before. This is the first one that's really come along since they've made the decision not to build their church at this location that met their mission. So again, I'm not going to address the staff report in any great detail. The staff, as always, did a good job in, in making their presentation. Um, Mr. O'Loughlin and Pastor Watkins will go into a little bit more detail to discuss, um, you know, kind of their goals and desires for this property as, uh, as they move through this process. Do have a couple of questions with respect to the conditions. Generally, I think uh, my clients are fine with the conditions that have been, um, been proposed. Question number one is with respect to the um, berm, the additional landscaping on the south side of the property. Um, as, as the current uh, preliminary development plan shows, there's some, some landscaping that's been, been offered up there and a fence. So I think the question for staff is in their recommendation for medium density uh, landscaping at this location, is it in addition to the fence or is it in lieu of the fence? Second question is with respect to the sidewalks. Again, my, my client has proposed that there be sidewalks in there. Uh, just want, to, want a clarification uh, with respect to the width of the sidewalks and make sure that uh, a, five foot si a five foot wide sidewalk is actually the standard width for sidewalks in the city. Again, uh, my clients can address that as when they get up here to speak. So before I close and turn this over to Mr. O'Loughlin, I, I would like to just draw your attention, if I might, to the staff report. Um, yeah, specifically at item number eight in the conditions on the uh, review uh, criteria of the staff report. And I think, I think it summarizes very well uh, what the intent and the goal of, of, of this proposal. So I'll, I, I would just like to quote from that, um, from that staff report. It says, this proposed use will advance the guiding principles of, the, uh, of, um, and of creating desert, uh, diversity of housing and thus the welfare of the community. And I think that speaks largely for this, uh, for this proposal. With that, unless there are any questions from the commissioner of myself, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. O'Loughlin. Let's hear from Mr. McLaughlin, and then we'll bring both of you back. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Laughlin, please state your name and address. Yes, and tell uh, us my your name story. is. Joey O'Loughlin, and I live uh, not too far from here, actually, 3601 South Marshall Drive here in Independence. And uh, I've driven by this piece of land many times. And uh, my background in uh, aging services management, I got a master's in that from USC. And this, this land jumped out to me as a, a great place where um, we, we could fulfill a great need. Uh, what's the best way to move through these slides? Okay. Uh, can you see these? Yeah. Okay. So we've got a team, excellent team. Brian Ron is here just as a designer. Um, Anglewood Assembly of God Church, uh, as Bill said, has owned this for many, many years. And um, they are strict in fulfilling their mission. Uh, to improve the community and also to enhance the neighborhood around it, uh, but their their mission to serve the community. They they do a lot of public service, and um, as Bill mentioned, we we had a meeting of the minds and wanted to do something good here. Um, Robert Walquist is probably dirt biking somewhere. He's not here tonight. Um, if you can go ahead and scroll down to around slide eight. Let's see. <clears throat> Q 
keep going. Okay, right here. So here's the land. Um, currently zoned R6, which is six houses per acre. And uh, now it's C1. This is just an old, old survey. The, I like the, the vintage on it. But um, different, different allowed uses as is. Uh, one would be um, a multi-story, like a, maybe a three-story uh, building with apartments on the second and third level and then um, uh, commercial on the first floor. Uh, a lot of different uses here in C1. And um, you know, as we've thought about you know, how, do we, how do we develop this land within the you know, current allowed uses, we thought, you know, we, we could look at um, developing this for, you know, for housing. There's a huge need for housing, especially um, age-appropriate housing. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you. And now to the next one. So just as a, a brief overview, uh, there's, there is a huge need for uh, age-friendly housing. Uh, there's been a lot of back and forth that's gone into what we have here tonight, and without going into lengthy detail, it's, uh, we've, we've put together a lot of different concepts, and what we have tonight is uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of thought put into it, and um, we, I hope you like it. Uh, the floor plan as well as the community is very aging friendly, and uh, this will provide an ongoing benefit for, for many years. Uh, next slide, please. So right there is a tidal wave. Some people want to surf on it. Some people want to just get out of the way, but it's there nonetheless. And this is uh, you know, the, the tidal wave of aging. You know, the, the baby boomers, um, what do we do? That's my parents. Uh, their parents, if you, um, let's go ahead and skip down three, one, two, three slides. One more, please. Yep. We'll just skip to here. This is my grandparents' house uh, on Rolf Road in DeKalb, Illinois. My parents were teachers, and uh, my grandpa was teaching at Northern Illinois University, and my grandma taught at uh, grade school for 60 years. And uh, my parents met at the university there. And uh, when my dad's parents got older, this is, this is the house they had. They loved it when they, were, when they first moved in but two stories in a basement. Uh, how do you get up and down? And um, my grandpa actually had a stroke, and that's what precipitated the move. They, they weren't able at all to stay there. And I, I share this because this is a very, this, this, uh, how this plays out is, is very common. Um, so what, what were their alternatives? Let's go to the next slide, please. So the typical is people will go to a nursing home, and that's kind of, it's pricey, uh, but it's people who, in their present uh, setting, they need someone with them almost 24-7, at least to stop in many times a day, gets expensive. Uh, nursing homes are expensive. Uh, something that, so the, what we see is independent living is, uh, it's more than, I guess there's a little more than meets the eye. It's a concept uh, that was kind of thought of, thought of in Europe and the idea is that you can stay in this setting through the end of your life. There's, there's you know, things that, that happen where there's exceptions, but in general, people can stay here. It's all on one level. It's got widened doorways, uh, low, low uh, threshold shower, uh, a lot of people together. So you, you go outside, you have a, you, know, you fall, your neighbor's gonna be there to help you out. Uh, you're not you're kind of stuck hoping that someone's going to come on a walk and, and see you. you know, someone's going to see as they're out and, out and about. But the, the community is an important part of this. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. And one, one other important feature of this, let's go ahead and skip down to the floor plan, if you can, maybe five slides or so. Uh, as, as you can see, just in general, it's, it's a very nice uh, floor plan. This is, uh, Brian and I worked on this a lot. There's a lot of thought that went into this besides just, you know, a little bit wider doorways. Um, 
the reason that there's two bedrooms, and that a lot of these just have one bedroom and one bath, uh, two bedrooms, as you get to the end of your life, you want someone there. Could be a family member, um, but you'll, you might want someone there 24 seven or at least sleep in there at night. Uh, and then a second bathroom is much more convenient than, than one. Um, but you know, if you look in the, the master suite, there's a, it's a large walk-in closet. It's a roomy living room. Uh, we've got an island in the kitchen. It's, it's kind of a cool floor plan. Uh, this is just under 1,000 square feet for garage and non-garage units. So it's, I mean, it's nice. Uh, let's go to um, where we can see the units on the outside again. Could be at the very end. Only one more. Um, thank you. So. Um, do you want to say what's so cool about this? And there's more than just two designs. Can we do that? He made a note. If you want to talk to the exterior and to the interior. Please state your name and address. My name is Brian Ron, 1000 Northwest High Point Drive, Lee Summit, Missouri. Uh, thank you for your consideration of the project. As Joey mentioned, you know, his, his passion is that you know, we put together a project that, w that would meet a need, not just, um, you know, let's go out there and, you know, build something that, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of. There's, you know, there are things out there, but this project's unique. So as the designer on it, you know, he brought some ideas to me and stuff like that that he had, and, you know, I have a lot of experience, um, you know, almost 30 years' experience of designing projects. And normally on these types of things, you know, I'd put one bathroom in. Joey said, no, you know, we, this is what we want. And as we've worked through this, we also looked at the community, uh, not just, you know, what is going to be appropriate for, you know, the floor plans and everything, but what's going to be appropriate with the neighborhood, the community, you know, and what, what you know, looking for to, to meet the needs for, you know, moving forward. In, in a in a type of project where people are going to be aging in place, so you know throughout the the entire project, a lot of thought went into those things. It wasn't just you know, hey, here's you know, let's go online, grab a floor plan, you know, set it on a piece of ground, and uh, let's get moving. You know, we were engaged because they had goals, they had ideas, and you know, we've worked, you know for quite a while on this to, to meet all those goals, but still at the same time come up with a viable project. Because everybody knows that, you know, things have escalated tremendously, costs and everything, you know, those things are factors as well. So we had to come up with a project, you know, both that met the, you know, the site and was appropriate there, architecturally was appealing, met the, the goals for aging in place and was still viable. pull up the uh, stack staff recommendations if you give me a moment and uh, thanks for your patience I know every especially when nothing's going on. Placed it. Do you have it, Andy? Yeah. Yes. Sorry about that. So, uh, recommendation one for the final development plan create a denser land. Let's go ahead and go to the uh, site plan now. see that okay because I think this is might be some things you have questions about um, 
create a denser landscape buffer along the southern edge of the property, create a medium density landscape buffer for the landscaping section of the UDO. We're, we're okay with that. that um, we we want to have a buffer. We want to feel everyone who's, especially uh, everyone whose backyard is right up to it. We want you to feel like you've still got your own backyard. Oh, we still want you to feel like you've got your own backyard. <laughs> I know that's not just you, Steve, but um, we, we respect that. We want this to be something. Please that. address your comments to the commissioners. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, provide a four-foot-high berm along Lee Summit Road. Um, we, we're happy to do that. Uh, all sidewalks must be five feet wide, and we're, we're going to, we, we want to, we're, we're willing to do that um, if, if that's what's, what's required. Um, provide per parking lot perimeter trees and shrubs. Uh, we're, we're okay with, do with doing that. And uh, also add an elevation of an entry sign feature. We're excited to do that. Uh, stripe the left turn lane at the entrance to the proposed, proposed development. We're happy to do that as well. Um, the masonry facades on the front uh, carried for at least two feet on and uh, replant the property shall be um, submitted prior to approval. Just a couple more things. Um, we did hold a neighborhood meeting on April 14th to uh, get feedback into the, the project and we've integrated uh, the feedback into this project, into the site plan. Um, there was a traffic study uh, conducted, and um, even though the, and, and just one aspect of it, there were, it was shown that, uh, this is by the traffic engineering firm, at AM peak hour, this would uh, create an additional 15 cars in and 30 cars out. And at PM peak hour, 32 cars in and 20 out. So a very uh, minimal impact on the volume. Uh, the street's already set up for a much higher volume. Um, and, and part of it is due to because it is uh, just the, the type of neighborhood that it is. Um, three concluding thoughts. <clears throat> the purpose uh, of Lee Summit, li of, uh, Summit Living Townhomes is to help older adults remain in the community as well as remain independent. Uh, there are currently 600 um, units that are kind of for older adults, independent living and assisted living uh, versus about 24,000 people who are 65 plus in independence. Uh, this proposal, as, as Brian said, uh, relates to the goal to achieve livability, choice, access, health, and safety through a quality built environment through building new housing units to fill a market need. And then the comprehensive plan guiding principles most relevant to the proposed development, and this is again taking Brian's words, but I thought they were very uh, um, appropriate. Provide a, a diversity of housing options in all neighborhoods Neighborhoods and housing should be designed to be inclusive of the needs of the wide span of mobility. Um, thank you. Does that conclude your presentation, sir? Uh, Brandon, the pastor of Englewood Assembly of God is going to address us all. Uh, the pastor of Englewood Assembly of God well, has some thoughts. Thank you, Pastor. Please state your name and address. Mr. Chairman, it's a privilege to be here with you tonight. Um, and uh, <clears throat> on behalf of um, 
Myself, I'm Reverend Brandon Whitekiss, 717 Southwest 40th Street in Blue Springs, Missouri. Uh, I've been a part of Inglewood Church for 13 years. And uh, Inglewood has been in the community for over 77. Um, we, our, our desire is to honor um, that neighborhood. Uh, we've owned that property for 35 plus years. That originally, uh, <clears throat> I was in grade school when they bought that property, living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, so I wasn't around then. But um, the desire was to, when they purchased that property, to eventually someday put a school as well as uh, a church building on that property. Um, the way brick and mortar buildings are today, it would not be feasible. <clears throat> we could go to the Walmart or the Kmart on 70 Highway and put a church there, um, one third the price than to buy or build a new building. It is C1 and on the south end of that property. And as the planning commission knows, um, your desire in the comprehensive study and the approval is to make that more residential. That's what we want to honor um, versus bringing in commercial development, which we could currently do on the C1. Um, we, want, we are going to develop that, but we would prefer to develop in residential to go along with the commission's uh, desires. Um, we we want to do so also by meeting a need. And the recent study that has been done uh, for this city, uh, for multifamily um, available housing in Independence, it is, uh, it is a need. And this is one way to help uh, fulfill that need by also embracing some of the community um, service that we get to do on a regular basis. By owning this piece of property, um, it'll allow us to contribute um, in a charitable way at a higher level um, in independence. We actually are one of the largest food distributing agencies in independence today. We feed between 12 to 1,800 people every month. Um, it's, it's something we have been a part of for many years in partnership with harvesters, but uh, we want to continue to, to embrace that community that way. This allows us to uh, further our efforts. Uh, with that said, we also want to respect that neighborhood in that area, and uh, we're going to do everything possible um, on, our, on, be, on be, our behalf to, to honor our neighbors and make it um, a very nice uh, facility for those that are need uh, need housing for aging in place. And so with that said, uh, I want to respect your time and yield back to you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Pastor. Is there anyone else, Mr. Lachlan? Thank you. Any questions from the commissioners? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could, I yeah. do believe the applicant asked two questions of staff. I don't know oh, if yes, those correct. were answered. Let's go there. The first question I had recorded was uh, st uh, applicant asked if for number one, the um, the medium intensity landscape buffer was in addition to a fence or in lieu of. And the other question was with respect to number three uh, of the conditions, whether the five foot um, wide mm -hmm. sidewalks are actually what the city standards are. Currently along there, there where there is fence, it's, I believe it's like lot, most of it's wrought iron. Um, I don't think we want to put a solid wood fence next to a wrought iron fence. And if you were going to have a, a wood fence, you would normally have a low intensity landscaping that would abut the wood fence. But if you're not going to have that wood fence, then the medium intensity landscaping would, would create more of a, a thickness of trees, basically.
Councillor, did that answer your question? And the other one was? Sidewalks. Sidewalks, why they gotta be five feet wide? I can answer that one. Okay. Um, our ADA requirements per ProWag is um, a sidewalk that can actually pass two wheelchairs together, so that's typically five feet. Let's have, uh, is there anyone here who would like to speak in favor of this project? I actually have a question for the applicant. Is it, did I miss my turn? Well, we'll bring him back. Okay. Thank you. Please for state me. your name and address. My name is Jim Wallen. My address is 4710 Mayview Terrace Court, Blue Springs, but I actually live in Independence, so I just tell people I don't really know where I live. But uh, I just, I wish this project would have been done about five years ago. I've lived in Independence all of my life. My wife was born in Independence. Um, I'm 71 years old, and my wife, uh, in 2019, had major surgery, and she was at the point where she was going to have to have um, some uh, minor assisted living, and uh, she was going to be probably bound in a wheelchair from that time on, and our home did not allow us, the doors weren't wide enough for the wheelchair to go through, so I started looking while she was in rehab, I started looking for uh, places in independence because like I say, I've lived here all my life and there weren't very many. There are only six assisted living uh, locations here in independence and the average price for a month was like $1,300 higher than the statewide average and the, um, it was even above the national average. So it was very cost prohibitive. And so a unit like the, when I found out they were gonna build this, it to me it was just, it made a whole lot of sense to provide that. We're quickly getting longer in the tooth. And uh, so I just wanted to, I wanted to be brief, but I wanted to let you know, I think it's very viable for this city as a member who's been here for 71 years. Thank you. Thank you. For the sake of time, I remind you, if you agree with the previous speaker, simply state, I agree with those statements so we can hear from as many people as possible. Good evening, Council. My name is J.C. Gnote. I live at 2804 Northwest <clears throat> Nuttall Court, Lee Summit, Missouri. And um, I agree with everything that's been said prior. The only other comment that I would like to make is the fact that we've owned this property. Um, I attend the church. We've owned this property, as, as people have mentioned, for a number of years. We're going to do something with the property something is going to happen with the property, whether it's this proposal or our commercial op opportunities that we may have. The property is not going to sit vacant forever. And so we have, have gone through all kinds of thoughts. Do we build baseball diamonds on it? What do we do? What's the, less, what's the lesser desire of what would be the best for everybody? And that would be because we need this type of housing and independence. That property will have something done on it soon. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in favor of this project? May I, sir? 
Were you sworn in? I just remember. <laughs> then let's assume you were not. Please come to the podium. I will swear you in. Thank you. Do you solemnly swear that the information you'll give to this commission is the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please state your name and address. I'm Gigi Yates, and as of two weeks ago, I am at 16303 East Ellison Way, the home of my daughter that just found me as homeless, and I have been living in my truck before that because when my daddy passed, and when my mama passed, I had to take them moving all over the place. There was no place to accommodate us because of their challenges. And I have been waiting patiently for the Lord to do something like this. Is all I have to say on that matter. Because thank you God, I now have a home. And I'm not living in my truck. But I'm looking at several of my elders who don't have that privilege and are still wandering amongst the kids. Looking through the family. And thank you for your time. And thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in favor of this project? Hearing none. I spoke to the staff earlier today and asked had they heard from uh, the community. They said, not much. Well, this, applic this application just happens to be adjacent to some of the most thoughtful, engaged people in this city. They're smart, but most importantly, they're kind and thoughtful people. And Mr. Lachlan, I was delighted to hear you say that you had held neighborhood meetings. And before I bring them up, I'd like for you to come back and, and tell us about those meetings and what was the response of your neighbor to the south and your neighbor up the street to the north, to the east side? Sure. Can, can I add, because that, that was going to be my question as well, and then what in your proposal was changed based on, on the meetings that you had? Sure. So um, it was a snowy day, and... Uh, we, we set up a meeting to talk with the Drum Farms HOA. We thought we'd start there, because that's the, uh, it seemed like the largest stakeholder in the, the area. And it was snowing that day, we showed up and, and I, I showed them the plan. And they said, you know what? Um, I'd love for that to stay vacant forever. You know, it's a beautiful field. It's like having a, just a 13 acre backyard. But I know it can't stay that way. And so, you know, looking at alternatives that could happen there, uh, I'd, I'd pick what you have proposed. That's, that was the, our HOA meeting. Uh, a couple months later, uh, is April 14th, at uh, about 6, 6 or 6.30 in the evening, so we could get a, you know, greatest attendance. We set up the meeting at the Midwest Genealogy Library and uh, explained the project. Um, we had a couple people saying, hey, man, this is going to crush our property values. I think two or three people. And uh, it, it's, it's fine. And anytime there's change, people, uh, you know, you, they want to know what's, what, what this is going to be. And, um, and I, I don't know that they'll ever change their mind. There is a similar development. So this is, this is something we discussed in the meeting. Uh, there's a, a very similar development on um, Adams Dairy and Moreland School Road. It's actually quite a bit more dense than this. And um, the property values adjacent to it have increased. Um, I don't think as a result of that, but it hasn't hurt their property values. There's some across the street that are over a million, uh, some in the same, you know, adjacent to this subdivision that are in the, most in that subdivision are 350 to 550 uh, thousand. And it, it hasn't hurt anything. So that was a concern that we addressed. Um, Steve Weller, who used to be the HOA president, he backs up to this, uh, this lot. And he said the same thing, you know, I, I love the field, I know it can't stay that way, but can you make it more dense between my backyard and, and your development? I said, yeah, we can do that. So that's, that's something we've added. Um, 
one thing that I, I would address uh, that Brian Harker had said, um, the different styles of homes. Uh, he mentioned two styles. Uh, there will be a variation of, of hips and gables, uh, so it'll, it'll have a, a neighborhood feel through it all. Um, and if you look at the design, it's, it's, um, it doesn't look like, uh, I don't know, boring multifamily. It looks kind of like a larger house than just, you know, here's these homes next to each other. Um, that's all I can think of that we... That was good. That was what I wanted. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Now, I've told the city staff about you good people in uh, Drum Farm because I know so many of you, and I know you to be kind and good people and civil, thoughtful, but you're also neighbors. So I'm going to permit you to police yourselves in terms of the amount of time you want to take to present both remarks, comments, and whatever that you think is appropriate. So let's start. For those of you who would like to offer comment, uh, I have questions. Let's proceed, please. My name's Kurt George. I live at 2701 Breckenridge Drive in Drum Farm. And I just had one question for the developer. Right behind me is a very old and very tall cottonwood tree. And I would like to know for the record what he's going to do with that. <laughs> that's, a, that's a quick question, so. Mr. Oliveira, uh, no, no. And I actually personally invited everyone whose property backs up to that uh, piece of land to the neighborhood meeting. And that was something we, we've talked about. And now it's on the record. <laughs> please, state, please state your name and address. John Oliveira, 2525 South Lee Summit Road, and I own 2605. South Lee Summit Road. And I think it's a noble project uh, of what they're doing and who they'll be helping. And who, who they'll be helping. But I don't think that's the area for it. We've got enough problems in that area that need to be fixed first. We have um, a lot of traffic that comes down from I-70 that if anything's up there, we get a line of traffic, can't even get out of our driveways. The, when the schools close uh, and let out, there's a big traffic jam there twice a day. And um, the, it, I would be more for it if it was single family dwellings because exactly a half a mile east of where this is being planned, there are duplexes there. And uh, that's the most unsightly thing when I have to drive by there. And these are gonna be fourplexes. The uh, response by ambulances and police, um, they just fly by uh, there at high, very high speeds. And the uh, police, I've had problems, and some other neighbors have had problems with um, people trying to do illegal stuff in that neighborhood. And we kind of have to stand together to get these problems stopped because we don't get a quick res uh, police response in that area. So, um, I don't know, I'd like to have better police uh, response in that area. Uh, I'd like to have the ambulances take 291 or something rather than come down that residential area flying. Um, I guess there was neighborhood meetings, but we didn't get my neighbors who live right there on Lee Summit Road uh, next door to Glendale. I had the first two houses north of Glendale and uh, the people across the street who are good friends of mine, they never had any access or knowledge of these meetings up there. So um, that's why we came here today. But uh, 
I think it's a good, a good program and uh, everything, but I think it's the wrong location. Thank you, Mr. Oliveira. Please, veri please verify uh, the mail out for Mr. Oliveira. If you again, again, what was his name? Oliveira. Okay. Go ahead. Please give your name and address. My name is Kent Mounty. My name is Kent Mounty. Were you sworn in earlier? No, I wasn't. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the information you give in this commission is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Please proceed. My name Sc is Step to, to the mic. My name is Kent Mounty. I live at 2507 South Lee Summit Road, right next to John. And yes, we did not get a notice also. And with that, my main issue is the traffic. Right there where I'm at, you have 25th Street at least twice a month, there's an accident right there, right in front of our house. So when we're talking about a traffic study, there's no traffic study. When we put Drum Farm housing in, they did had a stop sign, didn't put a stoplight. City come in, they put a sign right by my second driveway. It's at 25th Street, that way. Middle of the night in the rain, People pull into my yard. So we complained, complained. Next thing we know, they pull the sign up, put a stoplight in. So if you're going to put this many housing in, figuring about 140 people when it's finished, leave it, go, coming and going, that is 280 times coming in and out, plus visitors. So there's 35 people, nah, that number's just, they don't add up. So I walk up and down Lee Summer Road every morning and evenings. Even last night, scared the heck out of me. Two motorcycles doing 100 uh, miles an hour, zooming down the road. You're trying to put people that are going to be, I'm getting elderly, and okay, as you get older, your re reactions are slower. So now you're gonna take people pulling out into Lee Summit Road with slower reaction times with people driving up and down the road that way. It is just not right. So you have to, if you're gonna do this, you have to put a stoplight in. And if you don't, there's gonna be more people injured, people that live there, and other people up and down the road. And it's the people that live on the road, like me, I have to back out of my driveway. It is very dangerous to back out of my driveway. So you're just gonna put more people in danger. And I believe in over 50 housing. I, I believe in it. But in this place, under these conditions, I, I gotta say no, unless a lot of things are changed. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, sir. I'm George Please. Kapke. I live at uh, 15800 East 27th Street. I back up to the area. Um, I attended a meeting that I thought was a neighborhood meeting on this subject, but it wasn't the same meeting he attended because I heard a lot of issues with this process and with this project and I didn't hear any comments about those this evening. Maybe some of those people will address them, but I have some concerns. First, I oppose the rezoning. I re oppose the rezoning for three reasons. One, it's too dense for this neighborhood. It's too dense for everything around it. 
everything around it is single family residence. You put this high density, uh, 10, 10 units per acre in this area that is, that's not what high density zoning is for. High density zoning is for transition, you know that. You guys are planning commission, you know that you put high density zoning like this next to a commercial development to be a zone or a buffer between a commercial development and a residential development. This is right in the middle of single family residence. Um, it's going to have a devastating effect on the property values of the adjoining properties. Uh, the city's staff's report as much as admits that and says we'll try to marginalize that or minimize that by hiding the project. They want to hide it, but they're not going to be effective in doing that. Um, it's too dense, it's the wrong zoning, and it's going to have devastating effect. I oppose the zoning. But I also oppose the PUD project. Um, in the proposal, uh, there's no setback or buffer between <coughs> my area, the, the north side of Drum Farm, and the south side of this development. Uh, they proposed to put up a fence, a six-foot fence. This property is not flat. I know the staff says it is, but it's not. It slopes up from the south side of this lot, the north side of our lot, up to the uh, north side of the project. We have a four-foot pet fence in our backyard. It does not even, looking out our window, it does not even block the, the berm behind us. A six-foot fence would have no effect. It would pro provide no buffering or blockage of any view from the south up to the north. To tell you the truth, it would take a 20-foot fence, 20-foot high fence. I know that because there is a utility line that runs along there. And the bottom line of that utility line is it's a transmission line. The bottom line is 20 feet high. I look out my window, and looking over that 20-foot high line, I see the half of this area up to the uh, woods on the north side. It, it, you can't buffer it with a fence. It takes... It takes vegetation. It takes year-round vegetation, and it's going to take, and they, they don't have room for it. They basically have 25 feet from the back of the units that we will back up to, to the end of their property line. There's no room for a buffer. There's no room for a uh, berm, and there's no room for vegetation. They, they are promising it, but they don't have room for it. There is going to be a tremendous amount of traffic. They're, going to, they're providing 123 units. If you figure two cars to the unit, that's going to be 240 cars coming and going. They have less than uh, 100 garages. So most of those cars are either going to be on the street or in the driveway. They're either going to be blocking the sidewalks, so what good does it have do to have a five-foot sidewalk if it's got a car blocking it? Doesn't do any good at all. And every one of them is going to have at least one car blocking that driveway, or that sidewalk. Or it's going to be blocking the street. If you put a park, a cars on both sides, there's not going to be any ability to traverse that street. <clears throat> I, 
I believe there are going to be safety issues. Mr. Oliveras addressed that. Uh, uh, I don't know where they got their traffic study that says it's going to be nominal. I think when you have uh, 240 cars, uh, and that's only if there are two cars in it. Now, their, their presentation said this is going to be senior housing, but there's no guarantee of that. There is no enforceable restriction that this city or any city can impose on any developer to limit age. And what's going to happen is the first day there's a vacancy somewhere, they're going to rent to the next person that can make a deposit, whether they're 55 or 25 or whatever. And they're going to rent to people, you know, the people I know who are 55 60 to 65, couples have two cars. So you, there are going to be at least two cars in each unit. And many couples that age have somebody at home. And that somebody at home is old enough to drive. And there's a third car. And that's going to be a coming in and out on Lee Summit Road immediately across from an elementary school is going to be a safety issue. Um, I don't believe that there is going to be a safe ingress and egress, uh, two safe ingress and egresses for a development this size. It's really got one. Uh, if the police can or the fire can find the key to the gated uh, store and back, uh, maybe they can get a fire truck in there or an ambulance. Uh, but. I don't think that's going to happen. I think that's a dangerous condition. Uh, I would like to take a couple of minutes to address some of the issues uh, or some of the matters that are talked about in um, the staff report. Uh, the first recommendation of the staff is that they do denser landscape buffer along the south, but there's just no room for it. If you look at the measurements they've got, on that uh, plan, there's no room for denser uh, landscaping. There's nothing that's going to, you know, the truth be known, <laughs> uh, Drum Farm is a planned unit development. And we've got short backyards. Uh, and, of course, the plan is that the next outfit's going to have a berm and a short backyard so that we've got a reasonable distance. These places are going to be in my backyard. I'm going to have a fourplex in my backyard. That's if it lines up. If it doesn't line up, I'm going to have an eightplex. I'm going to have two fourplexes in my backyard. And there's not going to be room for any uh, uh, landscape buffering. The staff talks about the um, characteristics of the area. Um, and they, they are trying to get the developer to up the, basically they say, we want it to look more like drum farm. That's what it ought to look like. Um, but that's not what they're proposing. And there's no way they're going to be able to do that with this kind of development. Uh, there's no way they're going to make it, be able to make it look like that. I'm turning now to the staff report on uh, review criteria. And number one, the staff reaches the conclusion uh, that this complies with the, with the uh, plan simply because it's residential. They don't say it complies with the plan because it's consistent with the things around it. They say, hey, it's not a gas station, so it complies. I don't think that counts. They, uh, the staff reports uh, that, that uh, this is compatible 
if we put all this buffering in, as I indicate, there's no, no room for that buffering. There's no room for buffering that will, in fact, buffer. They, they can put trees along there if they put them far enough apart and they don't, aren't expected to do anything. But that's not what this staff is saying. They want a buffer, uh, uh, and there just isn't room for it. The uh, staff says that it is compatible with proposed zoning that allow uses of char character of the neighborhood. Now, in order to reach that conclusion, that's number four, the staff says, well, there is a uh, multifamily residence uh, a couple of blocks down the street. Well, there is, and frankly, if that's what they're looking for, there is plenty of multifamily housing uh, right down the street and across the street in the mansion's uh, apartments. We don't need another high density development along Lee Summit Road there. And Councilor, I mean, Mr. Kapke, now you are making it wonderful points, but permit some of your neighbors to get some of those, if you would be so kind. One more. Absolutely. All right, one more. Uh, and, I, and I was saving this for last anyway, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, number seven, uh, they said that proving this zoning will not have detrimental effect to nearby property. And what the city, con what the staff concludes is that if we put up enough screening, and if we hide it well enough, it will mitigate the damage to the neighbors. Now, what does that mean? It cuts our property values. Instead of cutting them 50%, it cuts them 66 and two-thirds percent. That may be mitigation, but that's not zoning. That's not what this is for. And I strongly encourage you to send this forth forward to the council with a recommendation that it be denied. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to lend comment? I was sworn in earlier. Thank you. Please state your name and address. James Passaros, 2713 South Woodbury Drive. I am in the Drum Farm Development. I also want to object to the level of density that does not match with the surrounding area around the property and that level of density for the traffic to restripe another lane within the curbs is not going to provide for any kind of safety for a large volume of additional traffic right across the street from a school. It is a road that already has a high amount of traffic. Also, in the back of the drum farm area is a creek where water drains from that property. So this is an additional runoff that we'll see that flows down through our properties, comes out down by drum farm boys' home, and then goes into the rest of the creeks and waterways. Those are the items I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've been sworn in. My name is Ted Sikora. I live at uh, 2816 South Woodbury Drive uh, in the Drum Farm Villas. Um, earlier, Mr. O'Laughlin came up and so you agreed with all of the recommendations of the staff report, and I've got a couple of points that I'd like to clarify. Uh, you mentioned uh, two-story buildings, but there are no st two stories there, and the other half story is simply a dormer, a non-livable area. Please okay. direct your okay, sorry. comments sorry. to the chair. Right, that. And the uh, other thing is the uh, development plan shows <clears throat> on Lee Summit Road, you're going to have a uh, dog park, and I think a uh, community house there, 
Well, if you're talking about building a four-foot berm from Lee Summit Road back west, that's going to take probably 25 feet of plus, plus five more feet for a sidewalk. So you just eliminated 30 feet of his plan. You're going to, walk, you're going to uh, probably do away with the dog, uh, the dog park and very possibly uh, some other things. So agreeing with all of these, I, I want to hear how it's going to affect the, uh, the proposed plan. And I agree uh, with much of everything was said earlier. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Steve Weller and I was sworn in. Uh, I agree with what most of these guys have been saying, but I also would like to say that uh, my concern is, is they keep talking about this being senior living. And I don't know, when I was 55, I was not considered a senior. But, uh, and then they're also talking about the, the care for the people, what they were that concerned about the care of the people. Why aren't they making them all, you know, garages where you could have in and two bedrooms instead of one. So then again, I'm thinking you're not that concerned if you're making some singles, some doubles. And then also back to the dog park, you know, I, Right now, I'm the guy that's backed up to the field, and it's, it's pretty peaceful. And like I said, I've been there 17 years, and I really, originally bought the land across the street, but spent more money, more money to move over there because we were told it's going to be a church or school. They didn't say anything about, you know, rental properties, or I wouldn't have spent that extra money and moved over there because the people across the street, they have a nice, they got all the shrubs, they can't see their neighbors. And when we were at the meeting, we discussed, well, how about a fence? Well, they said, no, we're not going to do that because it'll be deteriorated. You, you know, you can't maintain it. But uh, like Mr. Napke said, you can't build a fence big enough not to see this stuff. And so if they're going to plant vegetation, it's going to take 15 years to, to do any good. If they come in and put you know, a little five-gallon plant in, and so once again, if they put in the dog park, I'm concerned about all these people with dogs, all the people on the street parking. I mean, it's a concern. I mean, I like the plan. I think it's great. And I did check around. There's actually 555 and older residential areas in Independence, plus 262 and older. So there's plenty of property out there. And I agree with everybody else that I don't think what they're trying to do fits the need for that area. And then on the other side of that, we're threatened by the guy who's saying, well, if you don't do this, we're going to give you Ballparks, we're going to give you, we were told we could put containers back there. So I didn't really appreciate the threat. He said that at the meeting, and he said to get a night. So once again, he's threatening us. If you don't do this, you're going to have these. So I take offense to that as well. I'm sorry, can we get your name and address? Uh, my name is Steve Weller. I'm at 15804 East 27th Street South. Thank you. That's all I have to say, but I oppose this. Hi, my name is John Darst. I live at 2741 South Breckenridge in Independence. And I agree with uh, all the comments that have been, been made so far. Uh, I'd also like to just add one other comment. Um, what you saw was a very nice picture of a fourplex. What you didn't see up there was a fourplex that didn't have driveways that, did, that had a concrete parking lot that had uh, approximately 30 parking spaces in it. There are two of those. And <clears throat> I feel like it was misrepresented when all was shown was just a, a pretty nice looking fourplex up there. I don't think. It's on the north side and I don't think you have a good picture of it. But uh, if you look in the, uh, the plan, it was a pretty dense looking area. And that's the thing I'm in, in, uh, opposed of is the density of the population in that neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any additional comments? Hi, my name is Pam Nickerson. I'm in Swan 
2420 South East Summer Road in the Finnwoods. And uh, I had a couple uh, questions, comments, which I agree with everyone else. Uh, one of my questions is I'm assuming the Department of Education doesn't know that we're putting these 200 cars right at the entrance of your school and haven't been given the facility we have in common. Uh, can I ask you all a question? Should the education department be in this planning? <coughs> so that was one of my comments. Mr. Um, Chairman, I have to say that the uh, school district is sitting in the pens with the second committee on the first one about the issue. Oh, on the notification. Only to that. Number one, the little sign that's out on the front of that property, uh, it is a death wish. To go and read what that sign, which is the notification of this meeting, says. I tried, and unless I had to get someone to drive down slowly and take a picture, uh, that is the only way I was notified. I live on this and other, and I was told that well, they only have to notify you of the existence of the property line. Well, it's which property line, and then of course it goes across the some road. That doesn't count for those who live on the side of the road. And um, so that notification felt really deceptive, uh, as well as the threats uh, that, the, that they came across. So when I asked why we didn't notify more, it seemed that only that little letter was going to have to be notified. Uh, so my question is do we know yet who the city council or neighborhood council is in this system? He said he, know, he talked to the neighborhood uh, drug farm. That's not all the questions. This is a handful of neighborhood, and I don't know if the handful of neighborhood has been notified in the state. So uh, that's another issue I have. We have not notified any of the neighborhood who have been notified or up or down the road. It feels very deceptive on everybody's part, including the board's part, so that looks out of the way. Sorry. And then, uh, besides, uh, my comment on uh, the traffic study, which yeah, I would say it's more feet. Um, I'd like to comment on the sidewalks, the lowest entrance of exits. There should be no uh, light there. But uh, you say uh, five foot 88 sidewalks, but that's only on the streets there. All those little buildings are there, they don't have any sidewalks in the back. I went to the other part of the outdoors, and it uh, is very poor. It's squished in there, right at the corner of what was the least on the road and 21st Street, and they went one way out. I don't see how those people get out of there. If you want to see something, go look at the other roads. Okay? Um, so that is my question. Oh, on the uh, sidewalks. I would. Uh, a request that the council people go down there and walk up the sidewalk from that division up down to the street. As the uh, brochure says, uh, that uh, oh, that it it was a very good place for over fifty because they could walk up to where they could shop. Absolutely not. That's a death wish. The sidewalk sits right on uh, Lisa on the road. Please go up there and walk it. But no over 50 year old is going to walk up through that. And there's not going to be a wheelchair, but, but enough said with that. Um, so those were my issues uh, lack of notification, second notification, uh, school not being aware. I'm wondering what would happen if we told all of those school parents. That they were putting this entrance right in front of their school with their kids every day. And I definitely would have some comments. And I would like to hear your comments before you make this decision. But thank you very much. Are there any additional comments? I was not sworn in. We 
इसका फोर्ट
You need to know what people call it. Hi, this is Dan Nickerson. Uh, please reintroduce yourself. Say your name and address. Hi, my name is Dan Nickerson. I'm at 2420 South East Ellen Road in Hughes, Missouri. And I have one more uh, question or comment. I didn't realize until this meeting, but I understand now that the church is going to retain ownership of this property. Is or someone is going to retain? Is that my my question is that, is the church retaining ownership? Uh, my issue is, is that once it's zoned, once this happens, anybody can come in and take over on it. And uh, so that's my concern, is it may be just now with you all, but once you make it commercial, it can move them. And they can come right in and put highlights as well. Like, okay. I actually show you this question. We'll get your hands. Okay. The other, the sites of management is, uh, I got hearing about the church putting homeless people in here, or people who are in need. And at one point, they talked about the price of these apartments, but I've not seen anything of that here now. So that's another question. Are they going to be good for the market rate? Where is that? Or are these for the use of the church? Uh, which I do have you know. I'm picky on that, but I just want to know since it seems so deceptive so far. Um, so uh, I think that was it. Councilor Hall. Hi, I know you're being copious so. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. Bill Moore, uh, 4510, Bellevue Avenue, Kansas City, Missouri. So I did take a, a bunch of notes uh, with respect to all the comments that were made uh, this evening. I'll respond with you. I'm sure that uh, Mr. O'Loughlin will uh, make some comments also. But let's start with the, because I think one of the things, reoccurring things is traffic. So, again, just to remind the uh, commission, the city staff required that the traffic study be performed. Uh, that study was performed by a third party uh, engineering expert, uh, selected by uh, my client. But the parameters of the study were, were done in conjunction with the requirements of the city. City staff then reviewed those, uh, those uh, analyses uh, and as a result came up with the proposed recommendation which was to uh, put in that additional strike. I mean, I understand what everybody's saying that there's about 123 units that are going in there. Um, and there's going to be all these cars going back in and out. I am also a resident of uh, Drum Farm Villas. Uh, there's 143 houses in Drum Farm Villas. Uh, the level of traffic there is, uh, I mean, is significant. I mean, there's traffic going in and out. Yes, there was a traffic light that was, that was put in at the request of, I believe, uh, it was our neighbors. Uh, there seems to be a need for a traffic uh, light. That would also have to be required by the city, you know, pursuant to their, their requirements on um, mandating uh, certain types of signals uh, that are based on warrants that are determined by the engineering department. At this point, that's not, that is not part of it. Um, again, we're talking about senior housing. Um, and across the street, there is a school, but the school traffic is, as you heard, is. is uh, Cyclical uh, right now, there's not a lot of traffic that's being closed. Uh, during the school year, there's, there's traffic in that place a day, basically. Uh, and we understand that. The location of the uh, drive, of the street going into this development, was uh, 
selected uh, as a consultation with the city staff, having it match up with the existing drive of the school. So that was, that was not something that was driven by, by my part. Sir? Yes. A question here. You said it was derived by the school. Which one? The entrance or the exit? I think it's the entrance. So, um, also, I want to, talk, want to address another item, uh, item that was brought up. It's just kind of tangentially related to traffic, and that's the ingress and egress. Again, there is one way to get in and out of uh, this development of 123 units. Uh, there is secondary access for emergency vehicles. That's the exact same situation that we have in our farm bills. There's one way in and out. There's a secondary access for emergency vehicles off the East Summit Road that comes up, you see the curve right, and it comes up and matches up on the um, uh, front of the court uh, from the East Summit. It would be a similar situation. For this. Uh, so let me address this again. Senior housing and how you restrict this specific house. Well, you can restrict this specific house because we've all got federal law, uh, of course, by other regulations, allows for uh, restricted housing. And you have to follow certain requirements in order to restrict it for senior housing. If you do not, you are in violation of fair housing law, which again, we all know is very stringent. Limiting access to housing. So this this development will be constructed and developed and managed and operated pursuant to those like up regulations. Mr. Moore, would you uh, describe how that those restrictions are put in place and how they're implemented? Okay, so they're good question. There, so they're. They're put in place by, by companies that go run with land. Um, so when you, when you are developing a, a project of this nature, you create more, more regulations and restrictions that then bind this property uh, forever to, to be in compliance with those regulations. The only way to not be in compliance would be to remove those covenants. Which is not an easy thing to do. Um, and again, as you know, I think you all know, when you're talking about uh, restrict, restricted covenants of this nature, uh, particularly with uh, restricted housing, or in this case, for seniors, uh, it will be monitored. Uh, and if you violate, if the developer violates those uh, restrictions, the developer. Is that risk? That was one of the questions, and I know you can probably get to it, but permit me in my age to stay in the end of it. Um, I just <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm glad I couldn't address it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's talk about the ACB. South side of the property, and I think you've heard some testimony with respect to whether or not it is adequate or inadequate. Uh, staff is, is recommending medium density uh, landscaping for that south side. Um, there will be, I mean, it will take some time. And again, those of you who kind of have been in, in the community from the outset of the Grove Park Village. Those trees were planted. They weren't the biggest of the world. They have now since grown into what I would consider the nicest landscape in uh, landscape development in, in our community. I think we can expect something similar to that uh, along both the south side and along the street front and on the south road. If you can uh, expect that as well. I think at this point, um, like to say, the, uh, the law is up and they 
can we address some of the issues with respect to burns and the dog park and whether or not you would have the adequate, uh, uh, put the adequate landscaping in and still be able to be, uh, you know, to develop the property as proposed. Mr. Vice Chair, before we do that, can you take a five minute break? Is that all right? This is this is ten minutes. You go multi family right there, all all three melodies. There's some other fields next to it. You just kept going, and uh, I thought, you know, I, I thought my parents felt the same way. Um, now, when I uh, I told my mom that I'm working on this, she's like, oh, I hope you can make it as nice as what's across the street from us. I was like. Cool, you like it. <laughs> come, come to the meeting, Mom. <laughs> uh, but the, you know, uh, with the, the cost of development today, uh, interest rates, it's going to be really, really hard to develop anything less dense than this. Uh, and if you look at uh, this this development on the corner of uh, Moreland School and uh, Adams Dairy, it's uh, the property values around have not decreased, and it's not a it's not a particularly beautiful site, but it's not it's it's not bad. They maintain it well, and uh, the property values have not been hurt. Um, and as far as density, uh, I, I know it's an, an R18, but uh, we're building it basically half of that half that density. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the Drum farms density is. I know there's 143 units, and uh, I, I do understand that the north end was originally uh, tended to be multi-family units, and so that would have been a very natural transition to this. A uh, different developer bought that last piece and, and developed it as a you know, different product from the rest of the drum farms. Uh, but that that is, I, I just say that to you. Uh, that's, that that's Know, kind of the, the intention of how that was going to roll out. Uh, regarding the buffering, uh, as as Bill said, uh, the trees that are at Drum Farms now they they weren't this lush green uh, mammoth trees uh, that we see now. Uh, they they weren't that when they originally planted, but now it's some of the most beautiful landscaping. And uh, these conifers do grow up to 25 to 35 feet, which I think is an important thing that uh, that George mentioned because uh, I think he's right. It, it does need to be high, and I think the medium density should should be uh, the kind of trees that will uh, make a nice transition between the properties. Regarding the uh, the park, there are two parks. And they're not uh, next to drum farms, they're, they're more in the uh, development, which was a request by the city, not of the park. Well, they, they requested the parking lots, which we added, and they also requested that it be less dense on the south end, which, which is that's one of the things we worked through. We are, we are going to be partners on it, and uh, we're working on ownership of it. Uh, it's something that I felt would bless the church, and uh, it's, it's, it's something that I felt when we were talking about it. So I, I decided to, to go with that, and I think they are very amenable to that. It's, it will be a partnership. Okay, how are you going to be partnering with Ronnie? Open on land, or is it going to be owned by an LLC that will own the land? We'll both be partners. Okay, both be partners in LLC. That's how it's maintained. Uh, and so then from there, you guys are going to maintain all the yards and grass and everything like that. Just like, like we see on these some of the drum farms. I mean, that's a lot of money to be putting out there for them to keep it looking nice. I know that's what they're looking for. That's what I'd like to be looking for, too. Is that and I see, and I haven't heard anything about. Uh, 
I'll, I'll address that along with the availability and the neighborhood itself. Uh, that's for the, the housing type of thing. So availability for these units is, uh, I think someone mentioned there's there's five or six independent tenants. And what that puts us at is, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 units is what the housing is going to be And there's about 24,000 people with independence that are 65 and up. Not every one of them needs this type of housing, but there's a huge, and it's growing, and everyone's getting older. I'm old. We all want to live longer. And uh, there's a, it's a vastly, it's maybe the most underserved market that we have. In the housing study, it said that we need more of these units. Uh, it also said that if we're going, any development is going to happen in this area. Uh, it's, it's basically it's, this, this part of independence is on the border of what's labeled as transitional. Uh, and that means it's either increasing or decreasing uh, on the papers on the upswing or stable. Uh, so this, this is kind of a borderline neighborhood as far as the housing study is concerned. Um, once you get 23rd Street, it's, it's solid transition housing. Uh, just around where this development is planned is uh, stable. As far as the rents, uh, actually, uh, on availability, if you try to get into one of these uh, assisted living facilities, it's about a two year wait list. Basically, they don't know when you're going to be able to get it. So you're saying it's assisted living or is it rent? I mean, that's a little lost here. It's called uh, independent living. So live alone, and then there's independent living, which is kind of just the environment that's laid out for you. And then the next level is uh, assisted living, where you can have nurses. You have a nurse maybe outside of you. So do you guys want to have that? Or we not no, this is, this is independent. Okay, so it's rent. Yes. Okay. So as, as, as you say, I am mean, not assisted living. Assisted living. There are several in my own way now in the building. So look, let's get to the price point. What's the price point? That's not what I'm always been sure. Uh, Twelve fifty a month for the non garage, fourteen hundred a month for the garage. But with the market, that's I mean, that, that's pushing us up. How many square feet are that? Just under a thousand. A thousand square feet. We love we love her we, we love to give him away but we can't. No, I mean I'm not just like no no because we just put the number on you on the GI and I'll let them know it's not her kind of thing. Another one I'm supposed to have to sit by us and it's supposed to be and there's no guarantee, but that's what they say. So there. So I just want to know what your price point is. Sure. Are you ready for more questions or sure? Okay. So I'm looking at your drawings here. First of all, I can't tell me. The backyard and property line, what do we got the feet wise? It is 25 feet. Okay, stop. Okay, 25 feet. You're going to put those big old evergreens in there. Uh -huh. Outline to the property line. You put in two of those, you're 20 feet at least by the time they grow up. Basically, these trees are going to grow on top of the house. I don't like it. So that's one thing I can see is people don't like. The next thing, driveway and curb. My garage to the front door, how long can you be? This is where I wish Robert was here, I'm not sure. And can I make a comment on the, the backyard? Yeah. Tree? So those, the trees would be in the back, and we've got 25 feet. And uh, I think the people living in the units that back up to the trees will be excited that they've got the trees back there. Well, I understand that, but I'm saying you're looking, okay, you're going to say, People like to go in their backyard and hang out on the deck. Well, if you got fern plus trees, you're not going to be any deck back here to start. Maybe a two foot or a three foot. That's not enough to have a barbecue with people come out. I know all the people like to get together and stuff like that. I see no places like that in your drawings, in your pictures. I just think I see. I'm on specifics. What is the distance from by the house to the curb? 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet. It makes a big difference in some of my decisions. Yeah, actually, um, and I think city staff can, can give us. Please, you have to show. My name is Brian Ron from Dallas Northwest High Point Drive. 
Police and the Missouri. Um, city staff, I, I think, can give us the actual measurements. Uh, can give us the actual measurements that I'm about to speak to. But you have the right way of the road, and then the on the right way of the road, you have that where the curving would be, and then the easement is where the sidewalk would be, and then the property line, typically that setback. I believe it's 25 feet front setback, but I'm like I said, city staff can tell us for sure what the required front setback is. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, cars parking over the sidewalk. Correct. That's one of the reasons that um, that setback is in place, is because that sidewalk is within that, and again, I typically about 11 feet between the curb and the actual property line. That's also where your utility easements and everything. So that sidewalk is going to be sitting in excess of 25 feet back in front of the garage. That's how you keep your cars off the sidewalk. Spaces are designated based on the parking requirements of the city. So, you know, there's a calculation uh, typically, and I believe it's um, based on number of bedrooms in the city of Independence. Okay. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've met and exceeded the parking requirements. Okay. So, I mean, I know I don't have a I believe it's in the I believe it's in the staff and nineteen and twenty-three, I believe. Between the two between the two lots. So you got nineteen houses and you got nineteen spots. Oh wait a minute, those are the units. I'm sorry. Those aren't the parking, it's the units. That's why I'm trying to figure out you should have Yeah, 36. That's, yeah, that's roughly what I'm coming up with. 36. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. I'm curious on that. And along with the recommendations um, that were put out, you know, there's also, of course, all the city ordinances that also as we will be. Okay, so that's just on my question. 
Yeah, correct. So um, again, as I was designing this project, uh, we we tried to take it in consideration, you know, where it's at, the surrounding neighborhood, and and add its architectural details that, that we felt were going to, you know, be pleasing, you know, make for a nice community. And the fall stormers is part of it, but also the higher we want to, you know, it was mentioned earlier uh, about decks. And that's that's an important thing, but uh, on this type of community, uh, when you look at the floor plans, uh, they actually all have more front porches. All right, the porches is something that you know again in our discussions and everything that we want to incorporate that. So you're correct. We don't have a lot of room in the back. All right, but we do have porches you know, that are going to allow people to sit outside their home. Spend time with their neighbors uh, and, and be part of that community. A lot of times, you know, new construction, you know, the older homes have a real porch. The new construction, a lot of them, it's four feet deep. You know, it's it's decorative. These are not decorative. <coughs> actually, if you look at your floor plans, there's room on those front porches to, to actually have an outdoor space and sleep and allow you to be part of it. So we're talking about a front porch community, mm -hmm. not, not back, back yeah. deck. So, you know, those just brought up. Um, so these ones here, as you can see, uh, you've got the large corner porches. The interior unit has that large porch. These are the non-garage units. And then these are the garage units. You know, each one has a nice, pleasing front porch. We added architectural details to those that are consistent with the styles that, you know, are both transitioning, you know, from what's in the neighborhood and, you know, what people are looking for today, you know, a lot of tube styles and that type of thing. We have open gables, we have timbers, you know, and, and colors and stuff like that, but it's going to make for a nice, you know, nice neighborhood. I mean, people are going to want to sit on the porch, you know, see their neighbors, speak to their neighbors. The sidewalks, it was one of the comments that, uh, that we received is that there's the city sidewalks. And what about the units themselves? They all have sidewalks. You know, the entire project, you know, you're able to get through the project and spend time with your neighbors. Uh, I think there's a little bit of confusion amongst uh, commissioners. They're all two bedrooms. That's why I see them. Correct. There's no living rooms. No. I, I believe that's correct. I have all two bedrooms. You have. Yeah. All. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All. The other question, one of the other questions I have here relates to maintenance side of things. Uh, this maybe is more of a throw off on the answer, but uh, it, so this comes to light. Uh, is this going to be outside? You're going to hire out yard maintenance and it's going to be the distance of that. Yeah, this would be full maintenance provided, uh, including I mean, some of these light bulbs changed. Uh, so you'll have, you'll have property, property maintenance top bottom in yes. the door down the Is there any maintenance staff on site as well as all of it? I think we'd have someone on site. Maybe, yeah, you're getting into the more the details. Yeah, but yeah, I think we would have someone on site. Uh, that's you know, so someone needs something there. That's that's their job. <clears throat> so might see we need something at two a.m. and that's that's their job. Come on over. And I think the other question, the other questions I had were probably from the city and appropriate to ask now. Absolutely. Might take average two days. So we're looking for a plan year, you know, all the year of beauty. Um, as mentioned, covenants that would be in place to properly call, give the cost restricted housing. Is the city comfortable that once the beauty is established, once the covenants are in place, that this would truly, until 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 something else changed for the site, this would almost be uh, a senior living community. There, there was 
there was a fair amount of uh, <coughs> That's a legal question. So that's that's, that's that. Mr. Moore described what the developer would do in these circumstances. They would create restrictive covenants. Those are private covenants between the seller of the you know the developer, the seller of the property, and those who would own it. So it is not for the city to enforce at that point, but where the city enforces it is to acquire the restrictive covenants in the first place and have them recorded. Typically, you know, you all have maybe experience living in a homeowners association where you can't have a fluorescent yellow house. And if you paint your house fluorescent yellow, what ends up happening is the homeowners association will come after you. Same situation here. It is it will be up to other property owners to enforce. So if someone were if someone were to sell to someone who doesn't meet the age requirements, the other neighbors in the neighborhood would have to enforce that, but they could they have the right to do that because it, they were told, you know, the, the rules in place uh, from this from the beginning are that they have to be a restricted uh, community. So, yeah, they can change that. Yeah. They own it. Yeah. They're around one lot. I, be I believe it, this would be platted as one or possibly two lots, but most likely one. So it's a, I'm not sure how that would work. Who is the enforcement? Who guarantees that this, you know, remains a zero and I think we can have that, that question answered. It can change, but it is not about the same point of It's very different. But other questions? Commissioners, do you have any other questions? I do. The sidewalk, everybody keeps saying that this property is flat, but I heard other people say, no, it's not, it's got a slant. My question is, the sidewalk, there's no spot where you have to stop and step down or any place, it's just one continuous sidewalk? No steps. I mean, so... If the property goes down, won't there have to be on the sidewalks and truncated domes put in for the ADA? Just a gentle slope. I know we'll have park benches throughout to give it a sit. It's it's uh it's designed to be a very nice, nice community. Did I did I answer your question? No. Oh the question is when it slants down, wheelchairs and everything. You have truncated dogs. Do you know what you know what that is? It's a tackle or it's a it's where you cross the river. Oh. This is, this is that the only place? It's detection of their foot, so somebody can <clears> my <throat> side of the pair can feel that they're not ready to walk into the river. If, if I can walk when you need something like that on some places where well, the question I would have would be if the final development plan is not done yet, and this would be a question for city staff, is in order for this to be an accessible community, the sidewalks would need to be no more than 5% slope. Right. So it would not qualify as a drain. Yeah, so we use something called ProAg, and it actually uh, outlines the cross slopes as well as the you know, slopes along the roadways. Um, the truncated domes are typically not required in private. Those are for public uh, right-of-ways. So anytime you're crossing the street, like at an intersection, that's where the truncated domes are required. And they, they are required per our code uh, on any uh, city street that has a, like an intersection. So. Okay, thank so you. If you intend for it to be done to that point, you follow up question, if you intend for it to be an accessible Again, you know, the requirement is uh, ADA required, so the program does follow the ADA requirements for external sidewalks. Um, 
as far as you know, when you talk about ramps and things of that nature, really, you're really talking about the intersections where it may transition from a sidewalk to a curb. And so, you know, those can always be graded, you know, as flat as you are able to. Uh, but Perwag does require a certain maximum uh, slope. So I'm trying to think of all the specifics off the top of my head, but like 2% cross slopes, uh, they can follow the natural slope of the roadway. Um, but I think their intentions would be to, to grade the roadway in as fairly much as flat as possible. There's obviously going to have to be a crown on the road for store drainage, but uh, all the transitions typically are very close to flat at the end of a like, curb radius. Yeah, and that's where those detectable warnings are placed. I'm not as concerned about detectable warnings. I'm just worried about, you know, one, one day we're being able to get from our house on one end, <clears throat> you know, in an accessible route to another neighbor without having the sidewalk that's following the slope of land, which could exceed accessibility if we're trying to make this an accessible neighborhood. If that's your intention. Yeah, we want this to be gentle. Gentle slopes, easy to get around, and absolutely in compliance with all the regulations. The other one I think for these would be city streets, or these would be private roads. City streets. So you're already needing the, the roadway as the right way, the sidewalks are the reasons. Yes. And this is the new private and strong, just street names. So we're going to go back to compliance. I'm going to close the public portion of this and allow the an opportunity to assess this matter. Although the commission may, of course, ask additional questions. I don't have an Understand with any of the traffic information, those are all done by PTOEs, the engineers that are 
researching this particular project in this area. Uh, I can't speak to the warrant in that particular area. Typically, your traffic signals um, require thousands of vehicles per day at intersections. Um, so I can't necessarily say you know, if this warrants it or not, but you know, there are other factors that can be taken into play, sight distance, things of that nature. But, you know, as far as this particular project, I mean, our traffic engineer um, has reviewed it. Um, for the most part, concurs with what the study had shown from the third party traffic engineering. Um, and, and none of that had they recommended a signalized traffic signal here. The warrants, however, have um, discussed the left turn lanes. My opinion is that there may be a traffic signal put there that probably would help slow down the traffic on these kinds of roads because they do signal pretty fast in there. And without some concepts, they are very oddly, but I, my opinion is there's a little bit of traffic like this. I don't think that's a decision that was reached. I'm just saying that's one of the decisions we'll make the decision for this. Yeah, I think that's a decision that's going to be made. Well, that's the decision that we should consider. The roadbed whether whether we should have a restriction in terms of parking along the street. Should we prohibit parking altogether, or should there be permitted parking for only one side for the purpose? Uh, well, I think for the there's no way to put parking on there. You're going to be blocking somebody's driveway. They do have a lot of houses there. There's no, like I say, there's no way to park a car. Council, would you come forward, please? I know you have thought about this and anticipated that question. What is your thought, what are your thoughts along parking along the main road there? I think as part of the as part of the overall development and completion of the final development plan. Uh, I think we we will be addressing the issue of parking. Uh, that could be a neighborhood driven issue as opposed to a, a city driven issue in um, putting in some restrictions for uh, street parking. Uh, again, just use a reference from our village. They have a neighborhood driven ones in the city. Uh, discourage parking. On the street, on the uh, street market, right? So I suspect something similar to that uh, would, would come about in, in this development. Uh, the, the reality is that there's a couple of garages, parking lots, and the parking spaces in front of the garages. In terms of the residents, there's not going to be any room for on site uh, on street parking. Uh, but when they ask guests, those guests may have. So what we see right here, if you have guests that want to park, there is no parking except all the way up on the way the golf cart. So if they want to sit in the in back, they got to park here and walk all the way back to the ramp. That, that's possible. That, that's possible. And that's I'm not, not that is. That, that's, that's an individual choice that my individual can make. Uh, if they can't park in front of versus home. Uh, again, they, those are those are those decisions that, that need to be made. I guess. Good. Do I entertain a motion? Or? I do. I, I do have yeah. one thing. I don't see anything. But uh, <laughs> I did have one thing concern for a long time. Um, you know, mother nature writes herself, right? Uh, and from what kind of we saw tonight is that a lot of people. And I think I agree with that, and it's outside of our purview of sounding from the answers questions so you don't have to answer it. But uh, just so the taste as a thing of the of a guy who had a recent entrance who came up and said, Well, if this doesn't go in here, then we're going to threaten you with baseball fields. Just so that doesn't, like, so that taste as a thing of the and you, you did talk about it, you know, how you decided to come up with this idea to 
how you guys came up with that. Um, if this doesn't happen, then you don't have to answer, but like, what were some of the other uses that maybe came up that you guys, or maybe your plan B or C with property with the church? This, I, I guess this is personal, but when he said baseball fields, I was excited. That was about a mile from me. Oh. <laughs> well, it, it, that sounds great. Like when you say that it's making people sound like they are going to the neighborhood of baseball fields, it kind of depends. The time in which the, it's delivered. Matters. Yeah. So, so uh, just other options that we, we looked at, we thought, okay, how do we work within the existing parameters? Uh, nursing homes are uh, a permitted use on the C1. Three story or uh, buildings with commercial on the basement and apartments above are permitted. And uh, so those are things that we looked at. Um, I didn't think they would be particularly site, you know, uh, site for the neighborhood. And so we thought, what, what would really embrace you know, the neighborhood and serve a, a very, very serious need uh, for housing that's age appropriate? Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. One last thing I'm going to tell you right now. When that Steve Long was on this here, I saw the plans several years ago. Years ago. The guys don't go all the way from Melbourne all the way to the That's probably why I missed up. That's what we're doing. Thanks. So, right. But it's still done that way. It's still done that way. That's why 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 scale, we, we do require a traffic impact analysis. What they will use are essentially AASHTO guidelines. Uh, it's the American Highway Transportation Officials guidelines. They'll use ITE, which is the Institute of Transportation Engineer guidelines. Um, any of the, we, we talk about the total number of units. So you can talk about the total number of vehicles. That doesn't mean all those people are driving at an intersection all the time. So part of the, these analysis look at AM and PM peak hours. <clears throat> Excuse me. Typically, that's like eight o'clock in the morning, seven, like seven to nine, typically, and then you have the PM peak hours, which are typically between like four and six PM. Those are usually your highest traffic volumes based on people coming and going to work. So the question really becomes, what is the percentage of this use in this development leaving and coming back during those periods of time? So they, they primarily base their traffic counts and studies on AMP and peak hours. And that's traditional. That, that, that's the actual uh, process for determining your, your traffic counts, essentially. And with that, you'll look at your turning movements and determine if whether or not, you know, do you need deacceleration lanes? Do you need turn lanes? What is the capacity of those turn lanes? Do you need one or two car uh, turn lane capacity or do you need more? And so, you know, this is, you know, whenever we do these studies, <clears throat> excuse me, that the applicant will choose, uh, and it is required to be a licensed uh, engineer and they usually have a PTOE, which is a professional uh, transportation operation engineer uh, license as well. Uh, they do get re reviewed by the city. They do get reviewed by our PTOE engineer as well. Uh, so we make sure that you know, what they're telling us jives, make sure that it makes sense. Uh, and so, you know, when you look at a couple of hundred vehicles total that could be in this development, uh, does it make sense to say during a PM or PM AMP? 
you know, you're looking at 40 or 70 or whatever cars. And so those are the types of analysis that they do with the study. Um, there is a criteria that they need to, that they follow based on these ASHTO guidelines. And uh, it's designed that way, so it is consistent throughout the industry. And so, have cause to question the integrity of the <clears throat> traffic study presented here? Um, I do not. I'll, I'll say this in um, the history of the This commission has looked at a lot of these developments. I must say, this is one of the pedophiles. The density is substantially less dense than what we have previously proved. The great sensitivity is when it runs there in the subdivision. They're thoughtful, they'll have the blessings of the vacant lot for a number of years. The churches have this, and fortunately, they don't pay property taxes the way most do. But they've owned it, and it has not been an income producing entity. All good things must come to an end. I will say, I didn't perceive uh, anything of a threatening nature, but I think what one of the commenters who wrote this was attempting to say, make a statement softer. Something's going to happen here. It has to. This has been a vacant lot for a long time. I respect the diligence this applicant has taken with the city staff. I can assure my friends over in the Crown Park subdivision, the city staff has been diligent in its efforts to review this and to bring it to this point. Uh, I wish it had remained a vacant lot. I wish we could. Raise some hostages and don't want to go But all the land must have a high on their streets. I really do think this may be one that we've arrived at probably as good as we're going to get given the cost of everything. And I'm going to trust the pastor in this to. Be diligent in his partnership in this LLC. I do know that they have competent counsel, and we have listened. I think it's time to take a vote. This, this, I will let you make I'm just going to add also this is not opinion. We are just talking about zoning. This will move to the city council who's elected. Process will go again with them. So that's that's what happens next. Can I show you, Mr. Vice Chair? Yes. I move to approve case two two dash one two five dash zero eight rezoning twenty six ten and twenty six twelve southeast on the road with the conditions the city staff has outlined. Here is a second. I second. The motion has been seconded. Staff, please take the roll. Commissioner Ferguson? No. Commissioner Michelle? Yes. Commissioner Nesbitt? No. Commis Commissioner Wiley? Yes. Commissioner Young? No. And uh, Vice Chairman Preston? Yes. It was a tie. Three to three. Three to three, the motion fails. <laughs> the motion fails. That's the motion on to the city council. Thank you. What else do we have in the <clears throat> Thank you.